companies, check out our team building days, conference facilities and events. All this and more at sportirelandcampus.ie. A.M. This is OTB Sports Radio. Friday morning, 7.30. Good morning to you. I'm excited. Owen Shahan, happy new year. H- happy new year indeed. Uh, I'm very, very happy that I finally met somebody who shares my enthusiasm for saying happy new year all the time. Good job. You weren't here last week. Kenny Cunningham was on and it was January the 17th. He himself, I thought, that, having listened back, this wasn't quite the case. He, I thought he himself had offered the idea of happy new year at the top of the interview. So I obviously responded and said, you know, I haven't been chatting to him, happy new year, hope life is good. No, not having a pal. Went on about two minute soliloquy of how it's, you know, too late to be wishing people um, happy new year at that stage. That juncture of the month makes him feel awkward, makes them feel awkward. Uh, tokenism. Tokenism. Well, he's right about a lot of things, but he's wrong about that. Mm-hmm. That is a disgraceful thing to say by Kenny Cunningham. You're not having a pal. No, happy new year indeed. 24th of January. Uh, the land of new opportunity is still very much on the horizon. And the land of opportunity for you, Owen, this weekend. I'm surprised we were chatting a bit about it yesterday. You were like, uh, about doing a bit on the big game this weekend. And you were like, yeah, I suppose. Is it a bit of lack of enthusiasm I just because it's the league and nobody gives a shite? Or, like, is, are we, have we, is there an early sort of, as the Eurism began a bit earlier this year? I find that It's like Christmas, it's, it creeps forward a bit earlier every year. Yeah, I find the National League is almost like a backwards version of Christmas, where you start with Christmas Day and then you get into the excitement of it. Right. So you need to kind of just go to a match, uh, hook it to your veins a small bit for 70 odd minutes, uh, converse about the game afterwards, watch it back, perhaps, and you're like, okay, right. Now, now, now I actually feel passionately about what I'm seeing at the moment. I don't think there's too many GA fans out there at the moment who uh, are raring to go for the National League. Maybe those who went to the big Mechanic Cup games or the big uh, Munster Hurling League games would have started to do it. You can't just go straight in with Kerry Dublin and feel excited the, the day beforehand. It's but I guarantee you, come once the ball is thrown in tomorrow, everything will be back to normal. It's also not, it, this game is not one of the battle. Is I normally agree with you, like almost every year I'd say fair enough, like it's sort of a rinse and repeat from last year, but there's so much new stuff going on, there's so many new storylines that have emerged, even since they met obviously uh, in September. Um, and that would be the reason that I would think there's like a little bit of a reason, a bit of a frisson about it uh, tomorrow night on. I think that's why we're going to have more enthusiasm than ever for the league once we get up and running. But I just think right now it's always hard to drum up uh, kind of excitement or hype before mm. the start of a competition which isn't your most important competition. Like I'm sure for people who are donning the jerseys of counties in the second and third division this weekend are feeling a sense of nervousness, are feeling a sense of excitement in some cases about what their campaigns perhaps entail because they have huge implications. I mean, if you lose your first game in Division 2, you're, you might be in a relegation battle straight away, which means you might be in a position where you're not able to compete for Sam Maguire this summer. So those are huge implications. Maybe it's for people who are going to be going to predominantly Division 1 games are going to be those who don't actually feel the pressures of the league so much and by extension the, the excitement. Yeah, well, I mean, there is, and there's a lot, a lot on the, you're talking about Division 2 and Division 3 counties on, there's a lot on the line for the likes of uh, Westmeads yeah. having been um, scurrilously squeezed out of the top 16 of the official power rankings. Are they Division 2 or Division 3 team? Division 2, they've been promoted from Division 3 to 2. They got promoted last year, of yeah. course, yeah. Um, well, like that's scandalous, that's based on like some itty bitty, like you're the, you're the very one to pour scorn on these pre-season tournaments. They get beaten by like shitty Offaly or whoever it was, and like suddenly it's like this is this massive impact on the rankings. You should dismiss those games on for the you should dismiss nonsense those games. that they are. Well, this 2020, I would say. Yeah, but 2019, so. obviously, yeah, 2019, you wouldn't dismiss that pre-season competition when Westmead got a guard escort to Parnell Park Listen, for the final of the Oberon Cup. Dublin have had that Oberon Cup sort up for the last True. 10 years. So. It has. It's a duopoly, which uh, is kind of disgusting, actually. <laughs> Put them back in the top 16 on, where they right, rightfully belong. 7.35 on this Friday morning is a bit of a flavour of what's coming for you at OTB AM this morning in just a few minutes' time. Very exciting stuff. We're going to be speaking to Jason Quigley, who is fresh from his uh, third-round stoppage in Costa Mesa, California. California last night, 
uh, happened at around 3 a.m. Irish time, and we're going to get uh, the thoughts of the man himself, Jason Quigley, on the line uh, from California in just a few minutes' time. We're going to uh, bring you our top five stories in the morning, the stories that we've picked out uh, from this morning's newspapers and that have tickled our interest. Gary Breen is going to talk. Uh, Niall Quinn, I'm absolutely sure about that. And uh, Premier League as well. Liverpool get the job done last night in the most unlikely of circumstances in many regards. Their eighth 2-1 win of the season. I saw the uh, unstoppable juggernaut continues to wait to the Premier League title. Uh, sports news at about 25 to 9. Andy Dunn will talk all things uh, Six Nations and plenty more as well, including, I'm um, sure, we'll touch on Finn Russell's departure from the Scotland squad and the impact that's going to have on the Ireland game and uh, deal or no deal uh, with Phil Egan coming your way at about a quarter past nine. That's a uh, flavour of what's happening. Do keep in contact with us. It's OTBAM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball. Uh, right now, time for the papers. OTB AM. Right, we're going to jump in here with the uh, Irish Daily Star this morning. Salvation, FAI close to ceiling financial rescue deal is the story from Paul Lennon here that leads the way on the back page of the Star. In like Quinn, Niall Quinn, the FAI's interim deputy CEO. I've never heard such excitement about an interim deputy CEO as we're having about Niall Quinn at the minute. But um, obviously he says himself um, yesterday in the interviews that he's going to look after the uh, football side of things here and that Gary Owens is going to be uh, the man that looks after the administration and the other general running of the company. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know, is the sort of big thing about this one, about Niall Quinn and exactly where all this is going to go. Like, on the face of it, you would think that it's a match made in heaven, that, you know, he's a former Public Ireland International who's had um, a stellar CV. I had been over in Sunderland um, about 15, 16 years ago and saw the impact firsthand that he had uh, I spent a few days over there speaking to actually he himself, uh, some officials around the club and most importantly a lot of people around the town for a documentary that I was making at the time and the impact that he'd had in Sunderland because of the business acumen that it was brand new to him at that stage that he'd brought to it and lifted that club up off its knees. You could see that impact first time. There's a lot of parallels with the job at hand here. Definitely and at least he's coming to the table with ideas. Some of them have been left field, to say the least, if you go back through the, the relative interviews that he's done, the relevant interviews that he's done, and some of the stuff that's been said, say, at the, the Mansion House last year with, with his group of uh, idealists in Irish football. So you get a sense of what Niall Quinn's football philosophy is on a governance level, more than perhaps any other figure in the FAI now, and uh, the profile will help him, but it will also be something that will uh, be used as a stick to beat him with as well, because uh, he's so high profile. It's going to be very interesting, also intriguing as to how long he actually stays in the role, because there, there was reports recently that he had no interest in the CEO role, but is now interested in the interim deputy CEO role. So he's interested in uh, governing Irish football on some level, and for a, a certain amount of time, but you'd imagine that time is fairly finite in his own eyes. Yeah, well, I, don't, I, don't, I have to say, I don't like the, that sort of narrative that he himself has been putting out there about, I, I, I won't take, um, I'm not going to take any pay from this thing. Like, I don't care about that stuff. If there's a job to be done, go in and get it done, and let's see how it goes. Like, does he, he was talking about six months yesterday in one of the interviews, and does he take on the full CEO role after that? We shall see. King Henry steps down. Another line here from uh, John Knox. Henry Shefflin has departed from Ballyhale Shamrocks and uh, other news there from the Premier League, including Liverpool's 2-1 win over Wolves last night. Firmino arrives late to keep relentless Liverpool on track is the headline in the Irish Times this morning, while United are standing by Oli despite fans' ire. You've got a piece here with Danny Ledwith. Ledwith, happy to grasp opportunity. New Zealand provided a good piece with him. And Quinn takes deputy chief executive role. Right, Emmett Malone, former international, assumes temporary role to help plot a way forward. Uh, Red Letter Day is the major uh, picture splash here on the front page of the Examiner this morning. Joy from Mullins' family is Danny Lance Tiestes, the uh, nephew of Willie Mullins, after the uh, Tiestes chase yesterday. It'll be photographed there. Also, uh, some pieces looking ahead to the GA this weekend, and uh, including Captaincy Conundrum, an interesting piece just inside the Examiner there. Kerry Legends on how uh, the county should select their skippers. Obviously, the process of county champions. Uh, East Kerry being champions, David Clifford gets the mantle. Um, some interesting thoughts inside that we'll touch on, I'm sure, shortly. The Mirror leads with 40 love. Firmino ensures Red's unbeaten run goes on and on and on and on and on. Niall play a part to help my game here, to help game here, I should say. Paul O'Hare writing there about Niall Quinn's appointment last night. Improve dot 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 or else is the headline written there beside the face of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. So he's not totally out of the pressure zone at Old Trafford. League of Ireland walkout says Paul O'Hare here as well. Livid First Division clubs have discussed a mass withdrawal 
from the League of Ireland. Every option is being discussed, says one source last night, including the nuclear one, and there are a number of people willing to press that button. So this is, of course, because First Division clubs remain vehemently opposed to the inclusion of Shamrock Rovers 2 in this season's second tier, which kicks off in just four weeks. And there you've got that Shefflin departs Ballyhale news as well on the GEA front. Shock as Shefflin quits Ballyhale manager's role is also the uh, tone, uh, theme taken up here by Cohen Keyes in the Irish Independent this morning. Just days after the second success of an Ireland title, Kilkenny legend departs club champions. It seems for uh, personal and professional reasons that he's decided to step away. He's got a young family of five and obviously a job to hold on as well. But the temptation to have stayed on for another year to do the thing that's never been done, i.e. three in a row at the club hurling, it must have been massive. It, it surely would have been, yeah. We'll, we'll get into it very shortly, but I, I would have thought that if you're going for three in a row and it was something that was on your agenda, you would have kind of stuck with it or perhaps it's not a role. You've got a theory, on the You've got a theory. we'll come to it in a minute. Scott's in chaos for Ireland trip after uh, Russell gets sent home. He stayed at the bar too long, was literally what happened to uh, Finn Russell there. And now he's gone, whether he comes back or not, we shall see. And a good photograph there as well of uh, Virgil van Dijk and uh, Roberto Firmino after Liverpool's win last night. Bobby Dazzler is the headline on the back page of The Guardian. Firmino's late winner keeps Liverpool's juggernaut rolling on. And report revelations writes Sean Ingle and Michael Alwyn in The Guardian as well. Saracens underpaid Itoje to get round cap, league claimed. It's uh, the Saracens story also, the Times London this morning here. New Saracens chief facing ECB inquiry. Uh, Griffiths acted as an unregistered cricket agent. This is an incredible story that's slowly edging its way towards Hollywood script. Um, this is a story that, the, uh, as is written about here, the executive appointed to Lee Saracens through the salary cap scandal has been reported to the England and Wales Cricket Board over allegations that he worked as an unregistered agent in the transfer of players. Just when you think that the story has reached an end and is about to get solved in some way, it uh, delivers yet a new uh, twist. Daily Telegraph goes with the exact same headline as The Guardian. Bobby Dazzler, Firmino grabs late winner to keep on beating Liverpool 16 points clear at the top. I know he's a bit of an outsider at the moment, but I think Roberto Firmino should be in the conversation for PFA Player of the Year, he, like a couple of his own teammates. You could probably pick out three of them in Van Dijk, Mane and Henderson, and Henderson who would yeah. be ahead of them in the likelihood. But I think Roberto Firmino should be a serious uh, candidate for, for all the players voting. He's 10th away goal of the season, something like that, 8 or 10, something like that. That's incredible. I don't, I, I don't know the specific statistic there, but his something finishing like this year has just gone to a whole new level. The Sun, I mean, while this is the front page, now will be there for you. Must be in the running for tab of the morning to you. Albeit not on the back page, on. Yeah, we, we only take that back page oh, really? on tab of the morning to you. The uh, Formidables. Formidables. Bobby has history in his that sights. It's not tab of the morning to you. Really? It's bad. Um, Bobby's history in his sights uh, there. Uh, Roberto Firmino's goal last night. Egan eyed for £30 million, writes Owen Kowser here. John Egan could become the record Irish transfer with Everton weighing up uh, a bit of £30 million quid, uh, for John Egan. So he's, uh, they're keen apparently on the Sheffield United defender, 27 year old, uh, who starred in the newly promoted club's run to eighth in the Premier League. So sure, watch with interest. The Irish Daily Mail leads with Niall's pledge. Quinn says, I'll defer FAI wages until staff are sorted. True grit is the headline there, beside Roberto Firmino celebrating his winner against Wolves last night. Shefflin departs days after Ballyhale triumph. And United flops are treated to a spa day. This is an exclusive inside the Daily Mail this morning. Inside it says, United flops are treated to a spa day. Massages for misfits as all his lads lap up a pamper session. It's blindingly obvious what the club needs to do. Hire Pochettino, says Ian Herbert inside. What are they doing? But, uh, They've gone to... What? So you've got Phil Jones, Harry Maguire, Jesse Lingard, Brandon Williams and Mason Greenwood arriving at the Mere in Cheshire yesterday. It's a health club and spa. So uh, they've um, gone to a luxury resort instead of sitting at home thinking about what they've done. I don't see what's, what's the... Are they saying this is an issue? Well... I don't know. The, all I'm saying is that the, all I'm reading here is that United flops are treated to a spade. That's what the mail are saying. So. Well, they're treated themselves to a spade, I'm sure. Uh, Who cares? You, like? I don't know. Do you, do you, you tell me? Who does care? You Who does me? care? You tell me. <laughs> the Herald uh, for you this morning, smash and grab. Liverpool's win last night. And uh, Quinn pressed for more FAI uh, funding. So that's the story of Noel Quinn. Benny Thrills Mullins is the headline on the front page of the Racing Post. She could be the best mayor we've ever had, says Master Trainer, after a sensational Galmoy hurdle success. And back of the Racing Post, 
is Stadium of Delight. In form, Black Cats ready to reward their backers. They're up against Doncaster tonight, and it's a quarter to eight kickoff. Uh, all right, a couple more to touch on before we leave the newspapers this morning. The Irish News there for you, McEnany. GEA are making life difficult for refs and skills being overlooked in favour of fitness, says Keen Mackey there. So that's the Irish News for you this morning. And up on offtheball.com, if you want to head along, you can see the news and we'll bring it to you in a bit more detail with Tom a little bit later on. But that uh, Serena Williams is out of the Australian Open. So uh, no title for her this year. That's uh, the newspapers for you this morning. Uh, it is 7.45, uh, do keep your comments coming in on the hashtag OTBAM if you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter or listening to us on the Goal Out app or on offtheball.com. Uh, we're delighted to have you and do keep your comments coming in with plenty coming up but later on Gary Breen is going to talk football. Andy Dunn will be in the studio to talk all things rugby so all that coming a little bit later on but a very uh, treat for you on this Friday morning right now. Jason Quigley, as we told you a little bit, er- little bit earlier on while you were sleeping, was uh, adding another win to his belt. For your winner by a knockout, he's the fighting pride of County Donegal, Ireland, Jason Quigley! Yeah, Jason Quigley, a 10 round uh, super middleweight contest last night. Uh, the main event at Orange County Fair in Costa Mesa, California. Third round knockout uh, for Jason Quigley of Fernando Marin. And I'm delighted to say that, as you can see, Jason joins us on the line now. Good morning to you, Jason. What's the crack, lads? How's things? How you're looking good. How are you feeling? Hi, feeling very good. And um, what can I say? You know, it's uh, it was a great night, and very happy to kick the year off now with a good victory and a, a victory that I was pleased with myself. More importantly, he didn't lay it loving you by the looks of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking pretty clean, so I am. It's uh, it's nice to come out of a fight, hands everything good face nice and clean and uh, you have plenty of energy to go out and have a bit of crack with all the, the fans and the family and friends and everyone that came over to watch. Yeah, sort of four hours or so uh, post-fight now. Um, just in terms of the fight, fight itself then, I know obviously there was a change of opponent sort of last minute you had spoken about your amateur background helping you in that regard that you frequently wouldn't have had a lot of time necessarily to plan. Did it all go according to plan for you in terms of what Andy wanted to get out of the fight and what you wanted to get out of the fight? Yeah, it actually did, and you know, to be honest, the replacement was, the record didn't show, but the replacement was a tougher and a, a harder fight than the actual original opponent, um, so it was it was a little spanner thrown in the works, but as you say, you know, through my amateur background, world championships, you're having five fights in seven days, you don't know who you're fighting until you won one of your fights, so... It's uh, it's a great it's a great background to bring into the professional game for situations like that. But getting onto the fight with me and Andy, we had things that we planned on working on, and I was very happy with my performance. Andy was happy with my performance. There's still, of course, obviously not the finished article yet, but there's still things to be working on. But looking at the last fight, it was a third round knockout as well. And looking at this fight. A third round knockout with two completely different class of uh, performances in my eyes. What are the things you're working on? Just composing myself a little bit more, working on the jab, getting my shots and everything taken off the jab when I'm coming out of throwing combinations, coming out of clinches, coming out low, don't be coming out with my head held high and everything like that, you know, and just putting a wee bit more venom into my shots, putting a wee bit more venom into my attitude and everything like that there as well. It, it's all starting to blend together and it's all starting to come come into place now. When you say there are two different class of performances, Jason, do you mean that stylistically? Yeah, like, after my last fight, I was delighted, don't get me wrong, to get a good victory and get the knockout, but see the next day like I was like I just wasn't happy with that like I, I'm i very critical on myself and I just wasn't happy because I know there's so much more in me I know I'm such a far better fighter than what I showed in the ring that night and tonight I'm a lot happier with the performance because I was a lot more controlled I was a lot more I think aware of the situations that I was in I was a lot more aware in terms of like I wasn't letting my mind get flogged with emotions and trying to get the guy out of there getting over excited getting you know that kind of anxiousness out of me 
Um, I was a lot more settled. I was a lot more controlled, working on things, seeing things clear in the ring. You know, slowing it down in my own eyes, and um, I was just, I was just a lot more happier overall with the performance. I think, to be honest, the performance was night and day from my last knockout to this one. And that's interesting. Like, how do you manage to do that? Because that would suggest to me that there's a huge element of control that needs to come into it. That you want to fight on emotion, you want to knock your opponent out, but you also want to maintain that control. Trust me, I've been asking myself the same question <laughs> for a while. So it's something that I had to control. You know, I was a very uh, emotional fighter. I was got very excited and wanted to please the fans, wanted to please everybody, wanted to knock the guy out of there as soon as possible and just get on to the next one. But this is the professional game. This is this is a uh, world championship boxing that I'm in. Do you know what I mean? And there's going to be fights where they're going to go the distance. There's going to be guys like tonight that had a very hard head, and you'll you'll not just get them out of there with one shot. You know what I mean? And these are things that I have to learn to control. And you know I've been doing different work with a lot of things and. I've spoke about it in recent um, interviews, which I think is going to be vital for this year, is momentum. I think that's something that is going to bring confidence. It's going to bring performances up. It's going to bring a little bit of everything to another level in my game. Keeping that momentum going, staying busy, staying active. Like... Since the time I broke my hand against Glenn Tabby, that was my big coming out fight. That was the time that I was going to shine and bust onto the world scene and be just a fight or two away from the likes of Canelo in a world title fight. I broke my hand there. The performance didn't look great. I was out for a year, changed trainer, changed location. Things weren't gelling well. Things weren't going right. I still just wasn't content. I still wasn't in a nice flow in a nice place. But now I'm getting there. Now I have kind of gone through that kind of a storm and that kind of a windy road, you could say. And I'm back here now with a good performance, starting to be happy in my, my own performance, starting to be happy in myself inside the ropes and uh, working very well with Andy. How did you find the quick turnover between fights, Jason? Because I think it's probably your quickest turnover since your first two professional fights. Yeah, I found it brilliant, you know, and, and that's something that I like to do. I like to stay busy. I like to stay active because I like being in the gym. I like being, I like looking well, being fit, being healthy, being in shape, everything like that. And, you know, every boxer will probably understand that whenever you don't have a fight coming up, it's always hard to get into the gym and to be in shape all the time. But I'm very lucky that, that I do enjoy the gym. I do enjoy eating well. And, you know, it paid off this Christmas. I was in the gym every day. You know, a big thanks to everyone back at home for the Fun Valley Leisure Centre and all the Ruffo Boxing Club that when I'm back at home, like Christmas Day, New Year's Day, whatever day it is, they're opening the doors for me, letting me come in, letting me train. And I stayed in shape over the Christmas holidays. I had a few nights out with my friends, family, the girlfriend, everything like that it was brilliant. I had a big turkey dinner, but I was still in the gym every day, working hard, training hard. And it is it is all paid off. Yeah, you got to make time for that stuff as well. Just when you talked, Jason, there a little bit earlier on about the almost shift it seems in mindset, that maturity almost that you have now in the ring to keep yourself calm and to not get too far ahead of yourself. What do you put that down to? Like, is there a maturity there that comes with age? Is it sort of post Johnson? Is there an influence of Andy? Because you've touched on some other elements that you're working on as well. But what do you put, I suppose, that down to? To be honest, it's a butterfly effect of everything. You know what I mean? It, it, it definitely is an effect. Like, everything that you mentioned there has a role to play in it. It's not just one thing that has happened that has completely changed. It has been um, a numerous amount of things that I have changed in my life, that I have changed in my uh, career, and that has happened in my career. Um, you know, the likes of moving closer to home, training in Dublin, training with the likes of Andy Lee, getting that momentum built up now, fighting, staying in camps regularly, no injuries, no cuts, no nothing like that keeping me out. All of that there is a momentum. All of that there is an effect of the mindset and the maturity that I'm developing right now. 
And um, you know what I mean? I have to say that the journey isn't always easy and it isn't always lovely, but thank God I'm, I'm starting to see some sunny days now ahead of me. Yeah, you're 28 now, Jason. You're back into the top 15 WBC rankings. You've obviously a stated aim to be world champion at some stage. Owen has mentioned earlier about the busyness that's come into your schedule a bit more now than it might have done in 17 or 18. What's the plan? The plan now is to stay active. I want to have five fights this year, at least four fights. Um, so I have the first time now in my career I've kicked the year off in January with a great victory. Um, so it's a matter of now staying busy. I've had great talks. After my last fight in December, I had a great talk with Robert Diaz and Golden Boy and everything like that there. And the, we, we set out a brilliant plan in place now for this year coming. And then after that victory tonight, we had Eric Gomez right up to the ringside with me after the fight, telling me about big plans that they have now ahead of me. And it's all exciting. It's all good. It's all positive stuff that they're saying and it's a matter of me now keeping this momentum going keeping this flow going and uh, keep getting in that ring and leaving men on their ass what are, what are, can you share with us what the grand plans were that you spoke about in the ring afterwards the grand plans are now as it says to stay busy to stay active to get a fight possibly on the east coast of america possibly yeah. the next fight on the east coast of america now madison square garden or somewhere like that there that would be the aim now, hopefully, for my next my next bout. And then to push on with a big fight in the summer and a possible uh, massive fight at the end of the year with the likes of a Jimmy Munguia. Um, I see now that Murata is probably going to get the Canelo fight. Um, different things like that there. Like, you just know the score as well. Boxing such a... It's such a crazy sport. It's uh, one minute you're on top of the world, one minute you're down in the bottom of it. But you can get a world title shot tomorrow. You know, I'm sitting there now with a with a very impressive looking 18 and one record. I'm ranking the WBC top 15 now, and coming off a good victory there, another one or two of those victories, you can be challenging for a world title at the end of the year. And these are the kind of conversations that have been going on with myself, Andy, Sheer Sports, and Golden Boy. And it's great now that everybody is on the same page. Like everybody has had this talk, has had this meeting. We're all on the same page. We're all chasing the same goals now. And uh, it's a matter now of putting it all together. Jason, I'm sure Andy would be too humble to tell us about his qualities as a coach. How has he helped you and how have you seen him grow as a coach, considering he's fairly new to it all? Andy's just so cool, calm and collected as well, you know. And, and I think, like, I, 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 I saw that this time around. Um more so than the last fight. I think it was probably Andy's first time doing my corner and well, it was his first time doing my corner and it was me first time having him in the corner with me and you know it was brilliant. Everything went well and it was good and I really enjoyed it. But this time I seen a more kind of a, a more relaxed approach, a more confident approach from Andy and everything in the corner and it was just a lot more I don't know the words to say it. it just like the relationship just seems to be getting better and stronger and like Andy's only 35 years of age as well like you know what I mean he, he's still in the same age bracket as myself you know it's not that long ago you see him testing out my gloves before I get them on he's shadow boxing you can see there's an edge back at home there as well you, you, you can see him back at the right you know. <laughs> but um no, like the relationship's great. I think the the age, the age bracket there between us, we're both on the same level. We both know a lot about the game, and Andy's experience and everything like that. There is just um, it's unbelievable, and you know the way that he puts things across to me are so simple, are so easy to understand, and it's not a hundred things thrown at you. Do this, do that, do this. We have two or three small, simple little things to work on. We work on them, we make them happen. And I have to say, like I see a massive I see a massive not say improvement or anything, but I see a massive uh, 
jump in relationship gelling even from my first fight to this fight so it's, it's only getting even better and um, I'm absolutely delighted with the team up. That's great. Doesn't sound like he's, he's been distracted by this other matter, this other fight that he's been, uh, he's been involved with over the last few weeks. Not at all, you know. Andy, Andy's very easy going. Nothing will, nothing will really sway yeah. him. Andy has, a, he has it all figured out, and he goes with the flow. He's easy going, and that's what it's all about. We can't take nothing too serious, or we'd all be pulling our hair out. Jason, uh, congratulations. Well done last night. We'll be watching with interest over the rest of the year. You've been a gent to take the time uh, so close after the fight to talk to us this morning. So thanks a million. Top stuff, lads. Thanks for having Thanks me. For See that. you soon. Cheers. Jason Quigley on the line there from California after that last night. Not scratching him, looking fresh as a daisy, happy as Larry. Life is good. Life is exceptionally good for Jason Quigley at the moment, and it's a, a story that I think everybody's happy to see back on track and happy to see him talking about world titles again. It's when he's boxing with a smile on his face, yeah. uh, it's definitely the best version of Jason Quigley you can get. Yeah, very likeable guy. Right, uh, 8 o'clock on this Friday morning. Glad that you're with us. Uh, keep your comments coming into us. We're going to have uh, plenty more coming up on 8 OTB AM uh, this morning. Gary Breen, Andy Dunn, Deal or No Deal. And uh, up next, our top five stories of the morning. We're back after these. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. But when I got to Liverpool, I thought, right, I've, I bought myself a nice Aston Martin. I pulled up on the lights alongside Roy Keane, of all people, and uh, I had the shades on. I think I was listening to some speed garage. My arm was out the window. Um, you know, I was having myself. Uh, and then Roy, Roy gave me that look that uh, he's given many a people in his in his time. And um, as he sped off into the distance, I was sitting in this car, looked at myself in the mirror and thought, I need to get rid of this. Off the ball. Weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB AM. Right, the stories that we've uh, picked out this morning that we think you might be interested in are uh, Niall Quinn, obviously the deputy interim interim deputy, whatever way you want to have it, CEO of the FAI. That's uh, deputy the, to the interim. Is that what it is? <laughs> Henry Shepplin has stepped down uh, from his role as the manager of the Ballyhell Shamrocks. Uh, hurling team, the All Ireland champions, back to back. He's knocked over three in a row. And Dublin Kerry this weekend, and the uh, uh, stories, news that David Clifford has become the uh, captain um, for the year ahead. Uh, Finn Russell has left the Scotland team. It's all about the ins and outs this morning. Has left the Scotland team after staying too long at the bar during the week, and he won't be around for the Ireland game, and maybe not even for the rest of the Six Nations. And the referee briefing at GHQ. Uh, in relation to the latest rules that have kicked in from the 1st of the 1st, 2020. So that's uh, what's coming your way. We're starting with, what was the top story again? It was Niall Quinn, was it? Niall Quinn, top story. And deputy interim CEO. Exactly. Interim deputy. That's the one. And uh, interim deputy. Um, so this is like something that ha has obviously garnered a huge amount of interest over the last 12 to 24 hours because not only of the profile of the role but because of the profile of the man who is taking up the role and there was quotes a couple of weeks ago where he said he wasn't going to take up the full-time CEO role but you could sense from him that he had some interest in helping Irish football and we've always heard from him in the past about this he's always had interesting ideas to say the least uh, but at the same time he's always had it seems uh, an idea that he perhaps wouldn't be able to get involved with the FAI in th the way it was at mm. the time. So if we kind of rewind the clocks back to January 2019, this is before the Sunday Times start publishing any stories uh, about the FAI. This is when... 2018. 2019. This is, this is uh, just o over... This is around 12 months ago. So we're going to go back to the Marion Finucane show at the start of last year. Um, so this is about two months before the Sunday Times uh, start, published their first story on John Delaney. And we had... Niall Quinn on uh, RT Radio uh, on a weekend morning and he was talking about his ideas for Irish football. Players are coming in, it's, it's, it's far more exciting. The clubs themselves at the top end, I think something can be done there too. There, there's a, there's a, a lovely little, little known uh, policy here in Irish government where we have a, an immigration uh, investor support scheme where, where I think it's lined up for business really, but a businessman can come into this country, he can pay a million euro, uh, he can stay for five years, uh, the million euro goes to charitable causes, and if he stays law-abiding for five years and is seen as an advantage to the country, he, he, he uh, receives an Irish passport. If we could attract young footballers from around the world into that scene who can't quite come to Europe because they haven't got uh, the passports, etc., and they haven't got enough international games played because they, they, they can't qualify you know, to, to overcome that, 
Uh, we could we could be this could be a lovely sort of haven for young Brazilian players, you know, uh, young African players, players who are trying to find a way and who would really bolster our our league. Put it this way, can you imagine once a year having a, a, a draft, as they call it, in American football and having every club, because of this money that's come in, they were able to bring in and attract all these exciting players from around the world. And the club who finished last in the league last year, they get the first pick right the way through to the team who wanted to get the last pick. It would be so exciting. It would be taking on and challenging what's happened to the game over the last 25, six years. So you can go from the bottom uh, with what they did in Iceland, put great facilities in, you know. And here's the thing, Iceland have all the disadvantages against them. They have the weather, as you know, the darkness, half the, half the amount a year. You know, they're putting in imaginative stuff that is really paying dividends. And we're sitting, you know, with, with these kind of ideas that, I, that I'm throwing at you here. Right? You know, it needs feasibility studies, it needs working groups, it needs to be put in there. But there is a hugely compelling reason why football in this country should look at itself from the bottom upwards. Yeah, so that's sorry, that's from December 2018, so about uh, 12, 13 months ago at, at this point, which is interesting. Like the ideas that he brings to the table, some would argue, are off the wall. Other people would argue that at least he's bringing ideas to the table. And maybe at that point in time, if we think about it, that the FAI perhaps had this sort of unbreakable structure. Maybe that was the sort of talk that needed to happen. Maybe idle chatter and reasonable ideas or very normal ideas perhaps would have just kind of fell into the ether and nothing might have changed. Like his point at that time was to get FaceTime with the government, not to get FaceTime with the FAI because he felt that he wouldn't have made any progress on that front. So maybe that was all part of it. But if you take that as his actual manifesto for an element of Irish football, it is. They, they are extraordinary ideas, like the ideas of g giving multinational companies tax breaks so that they can fund academies here, and the ideas of ha having young Brazilian footballers in Irish academies and to make them the next generation of Irish footballers is certainly a, a unique idea. And it's just worth reminding ourselves of that this morning. Um, yeah. Um, like, there's a temptation to say that it's... Uh, there's a, an extremeness about the ideas that wouldn't be, I don't think, 12 months on as consistent with where, as a society, we think now, post everything that happened in the middle of last year, uh, really where we think the direction for Irish football should be headed. I, it, they, it seems, at the time, I, I have only a very scant recollection of, and albeit 12, 13 months ago, of this conversation taking place, but... Um, I, at the time, was it like, did we say, ah, oh, this is this seems like a great idea? Because now, now I feel, listen to that, it's they're mildly ludicrous ideas. I certainly don't remember the, the, there being a whole load of support for the ideas. It certainly got a lot of headlines. Mm. Uh, like, you, you had plenty of articles being written around the time thinking, like, what, what, is, it, what is actually behind this? Why, why are you saying these things? These are clearly ludicrous ideas. And I, I just do wonder if, if part of it was almost to get those headlines to almost start a conversation about Irish football in a way w when there was uh, a time when the FAI was an immovable beast. So things changed after that. We obviously did have the revelations about the FAI. We had this football visionary group, which is you know an interesting name for any group of people who want to call themselves uh, visionaries, I think. But anyway, they, they come to the table. They had that meeting in Mansion House last year, which is probably fresher in the memory. And just kind of going through some of the ob objectives there, like perhaps these are a little bit more realistic or at least it shows what Quinn wanted to achieve with this football visionary group. For example, he mentioned the new governance structure adopted by the FAI by the end of 2019 and the new structure to come into effect. So I guess that has been implemented or at least we've seen a report into that. He wanted to see increased participation in football by 7.5% year on year from 2020. That is more of a viable thing. That is a sort of idea that everybody can get behind, participation rates in football. He wanted to create a viable and profitable League of Ireland by 2026, which I don't think is that outrageous whatsoever. Uh, now, people will say, well, that's just an idea. What, what is the actual engine behind that to make that thing happen? He says he wants to have one League of Ireland team qualify for the group stage. Sorry, I, should, I say he. This is the football visionary group. I, these ne not necessarily are all Niall Quinn's ideas. He wants to, they want to have one League of Ireland team qualify for the group stages of the UEFA Champions League by 2027. Then they talk about qualifying for the World Cup by 2026, the Euros in 28, and then the Women's World Cup by 2027. And this perhaps is the most ambitious one, win an underage European Championship by 2032 and qualify for the semi-finals of the Senior World Cup by 2038. So they're, they're certainly... It's is that almost timeline like, not at odds almost in some ways? Like you want to win the... You want to you qualify for the um, World Cup, which... 
in some degrees, for qualifying for I, the Euros, fair enough, we may or may not qualify for the next one. But like, is it not about putting a youth system in place to feed the senior team and then achieve after that? Well, yeah, well, his, his idea is, uh, their idea is that you win the underage Euros by 32 and then six years later you're getting to the semis of the Senior so, like, World Cup. I'm all for a long, like, I, I'm impressed by the 2026 uh, making League of Ireland a success. Was that the uh, qualify for for Champions League? Might have been profitable by 2026. Yeah, like that's Ireland, that's yeah. good, good reason. To, like 12 years is a long way down the track that you're essentially saying that like you're going to start working with three and four year olds now. So you're saying like if you're six or seven or eight, you're already you're already too late, lads. Yeah, the it, ship has sailed. Th there's no question that they're ambitious. Like it, it almost has a hallmark of the Chinese football aims to host and win a World Cup within a certain amount of years. Mm, Even yeah. in different parts of the world, you're thinking to yourself, God, that's, that's realistic, though, because they've got like an unbelievable scale of population. That but that's what that's what I'm saying. Numbers game. But like they're talking about winning the World Cup. We're talking about getting to the semi-finals of the World Cup. Yeah. They're not that different. Yeah. And you look at the population they have and the resources they have versus what we have. Um, so, like it, it's I'm I'm all for ambition, and I actually kind of like the ideas of having targets here. <laughs> That, I'm uh, all for ambitions as the man is about to. Ah, uh, not not at all. Like I, I, I think that there, there is very def, definitely different ways you can look at the past utterances of Niall Quinn, and I think you have somebody whose intentions are genuine yes. to get football in the right place in Ireland. He does have good contacts. He has worked in the the corporate area, the business area of football as well, as well as being uh, a top class international yeah. footballer himself. So he does have the expertise. I'm all for this uh, role. I'm just interested in what his uh, main objective is, were he to get the job on a full-time basis. Because mm -hmm. at the moment, in an interim basis, it's getting water out of the sinking ship and making sure this thing stays afloat. And yeah. that is aim number one. And look, do you know, actually one of the things, the last point for me, and one of the things for me is that Niall Quinn is actually, there is a, still a bit of an unknown quantity about him, which is incredible when you think about it. And like the sinking ship aspect, we spoke about Sunderland earlier on, like there's a body of evidence there to prove that actually that's something he's very good at. And you listen to his conversation with Tommy Martin on um, Virgin Media yesterday and he uh, speaks very well. He says everything you want to hear about changing the culture of it and it, clearly already there's some defined roles between himself and the uh, CEO in relation to the how this how these roles are going to be divvied up, but it, it's almost incredible to me that there's still an unknown quantity about Niall Quinn and his acumen um, at the level he's at at the minute. So uh, I think on the face of it, there there couldn't be anybody better, uh, but there's still an unknown quantity about it, and we'll see. He, he was talking about six months yesterday as a rough sort of a timeline to get this thing back on track. So we'll see what happens over that six months and if indeed he does go on to become the full CEO um, after that. So that's that. You don't know that? Will you, yeah, I am indeed. Henry Shefflin. Oh, King Henry moved away from Ballyhale overnight yeah, for anybody so who's missed it. This was, has come as a total bolt from the blue. I don't know if uh, locally it's at the same level, but after a couple of years and a whole load of trophies, um, Henry Shefflin has decided to stand down from his role as manager of Ballyhale Shamrocks. He'd won back-to-back -back All-Irelands, obviously, uh, only four, uh, four days ago, had a squad gathering in the last couple of days, and um, shock in the camp is how John Knox reports in the Star, so you would assume that it has come as a surprise to everybody, but has decided to step away for personal and professional reasons. There was the temptation to stay on for another year to do the never before done. There's a whole host of teams, five or six teams, that have done back to back, but no team has ever done three in a row, and that would have been the temptation. So, Owen, pour forth with your, uh, with your theory. Well, it's, it's not a theory, it's not that out there. I think I mean, Kenny Sheffield wants to become Kilkenny manager and he's taking his one last year out before he feels that he will be in a position to get it. Because you look at Kilkenny this year, if they win the All-Ireland, it's a perfect time for Brian Cody to bow out. We'll have managed Kilkenny to 12 All-Irelands. Nice, nice round of And if they don't, there is then a question about what is the direction of the team? Have they actually made incremental improvements over the latter years of Brian Cody's reign? There's an argument to be made that they have, yeah. that, they, that getting to an All-Ireland final last year was a big achievement and a slight overachievement perhaps with the group of players at Brian Cody's disposal. Personally, I disagree with that because I think TJ Reid is possibly the greatest hurler that's ever lived. So I think if you have the GOAT in your team, you should be getting to All-Ireland finals. But I think it's arguable. 
I think that people can also argue that they might have won the All Ireland last year had Richie Hogan not got sent off. I disagree with that theory as well. Yeah, th- th- yeah. this is the sort of this is the sort of area that Brian Cody has taken them to. Well, we saw the real Kilkenny in the semi final. That was the like it was the, Kilkenny the gritty, of old, exactly it? the, the and animalistic. Like, I, and he, so whatever, I know the final obviously didn't reflect that well in them, and I, I agree with you in terms of the sending off didn't really make much difference. Um, but he can easily point to that and say like I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, and and like the idea of Henry. Like, he want to be damn sure that he's getting the gig in a year's time, would be my point. And, like, that is a, there's a huge if around that. And I can't imagine that Brian Cody would have, uh, is ever a guy who's going to do that thing of saying, lads, I'm gone in six months' time or I'm gone in a year. There's all, no reason for it. All Ireland runners up is you're kind of teetering on something at that point. And I feel that at this stage in Brian Cody's career, Henry Shefflin can probably take an educated stab that that will either tip over into a lot in an All Ireland win, which would be a perfect place for him to go, or tip back to perhaps not making a semi final or getting knocked out in an All Ireland semi final, which would be the perfect time for conversations to be had that we need to get new management in and a new direction for Kilkenny needs to come in and Henry Shefflin would be perfectly placed having not being involved in the club at the end of the year because they might win another championship and he might be in a bad place to take it, he would then be in a perfect place to actually step up to the mantle this November or October, whenever their convention is and put his hand up to become the next Kilkenny manager. But it will never be taken out of Cody's hands. No. I think if that happens, I think it's a great occurrence, but I don't think he's planning for it now because I think that'd be like bird in the hand and not, etc. Want to get to a couple more before we wrap up in the papers for now. Um, we're going to touch on Dub and Kerry and the build up. It's in some of the, uh, new, a lot of the newspapers obviously this morning. Um, the one that caught my eye was in the Examiner, uh, page six and seven here. Um, John Fogarty's done a piece where he's spoken to four or five former Kerry captains about um, this idea of you lads giving the captaincy to um, the captain of the county champions. Is mm. the captain of the county champions or any player? Any on player county? they nominate themselves. Was he the captain of East Kerry? Oh, good, good. No, he wasn't. Who was the captain? I can't remember. Right. So What's he uh, captain of East Kerry? Oh my God, you're putting me on the spot. In, in my defense, I wasn't in the country listen, when the final happened. Ah, come on now. Man. Don't be using that as a... I, w- I was at the World Cup. He's spoken to Tommy Doyle, Darren O'Sullivan, uh, Declan Quill and Jimmy Dean and some great lines out of it. Um, Tommy Doyle, 1986 here, um, from Agnes Gall, uh, spoke about... Um, he says, I wouldn't lace David Clifford's boots, but a leader of players is one thing and a leader of men is another. He wasn't captain of East Kerry. Who was? Just come to Dan O'Donoghue who was captain of East right. Kerry. Is he um, in the squad? No. Right. Well, if he was in the squad, would he be no. the automatic selection? No. It's crazy, isn't it? Well, Clifford was always going to get this. The line of the, the, line of the piece for me here is Declan Quill uh, from, uh, got the captaincy at 21 in 2003 from Cairns or um, I felt I, I felt I was the wrong guy to be leading the team. I started the first championship game against Tipperary that year and felt the management had to put me in it somewhere. Uh, because I was captain. I felt I had to say things to the likes of Dar O'Shea to try and get them up for the game. Like, what a mad conversation. What a <laughs> mad situation that you're putting somebody in. Well, like, that's just, it's, it's ludicrous and it should not have ever been the case. Like, you pull somebody aside and say, your aim this year should be to climb the, sands, the steps of the Hogan stand and lift Sam Maguire. Uh, with all due respect, you will be part of our leadership group, but a leadership group it is. You yeah. will be uh, on a par with Dar O'Shea. You will not be the superior to the likes of Dara O'Shea and Okanade and No, and there's different styles of captaincy. It doesn't mean you have to be going up to Dara and like punching him in the chest, potty style and saying, listen, got my grain or ice. Like there's different ways. A guy like that, you just leave him alone, surely. Like but that that had changed obviously in recent years where you had I think you, you had Kieran O'Leary and Fionn Fitzgerald both hold Sam Maguire aloft mm-hmm. when they last won the All Ireland because it was neither of them was th- that much of a a player to the forefront when O'Leary had been named captain and stuff like that. So it was it was a, a strange enough situation, and that has kind of been more accepted as time has gone on that it is a token thing. It's changing, is it? Yeah, but then David Clifford get, becomes captain, and it actually kind of changes back a little bit because it's a class idea that perhaps David Clifford could captain an All Ireland winning team. It's the, not somebody on the periphery like it has been. Oh, on David many Clifford, occasions. the 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 flying the ointment of this idea of appointing the county champions, giving them a captain, is that David Clifford could become the greatest GEA captain of all time, hypothetically. Uh, so, like, in that then you have to take it off do you go? I, they, have, they have a good team, right? They're going to be around in the county championship by all accounts for some time to come. They, they were impressive. But, I give they get beaten in like a year or two's time. And everybody within the camp is like, Jesus, this guy is absolute captain material. He's the greatest captain we've ever played under. 
What do you do? Well, the thing is, it could easily happen that they don't because because it's a divisional team. Yeah. All they need is one of their good intermediate teams to get promoted to senior, and they lose all their good players. Right. And they could be nowhere within a shot. So, so they, Foss, if, is, that, is that the way it works? If Foster got well, well Foster would be wouldn't be anywhere. Near, they'd be right. like the likes of Glenn Flesk, for example, right. who'd be very strong. If they got promoted to senior, then you would lose yeah. all your Glenn Flesk players, right. and they'd be on their own. So, but yeah, it's a definite possibility. But I think they're looking to change it, and right. they're looking to make it a thing where the manager picks captain which is the way it should be and I think that would actually give you a 0.5% competitive jump forward it wouldn't be anything big at all but I think that if you had a captain and that person was the leader and the totemic figure in your team I don't think it could do any harm or they could do what Arsenal do and like do a sort of a poll players poll or do what Arsenal do and have David Kiffer walk off the pitch and give the two fingers to the fans <laughs> <laughs> no that's something I want to see that's <laughs> I think we have time for one more uh, quick one Finn Russell uh, out in drinking ground writes Alistair uh, Reid you'll have seen this uh, story this is in the Times of London he's left Scottish, Scotland's training camp in Edinburgh amid allegations that he'd refused to stop drinking in the bar at the team hotel on Sunday and then refused to train so it's incredible stuff, really. He's gone back to Racing 92. They're saying that the window is shut for the Ireland game, that he's gone from preparations, gone from the game. There's um, a young, um, albeit familiar name, that's going to be uh, coming in to play 10, you think, for uh, Scotland, obviously. Adam uh, Hastings. Adam Hastings, son of Gavin. Mm -hmm. Son of Gavin? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll see how all that pans out. But like this is an unbelievable blow for Scotland. And it looks like Gregor Townsend has just... So it seems like some of the players have gone to him and said, listen, will you stop and like come back? Because everyone's, that's what everyone's doing. And then that didn't work. And some of the coaches went up and said, listen, you're going to have to knock this in the head. And he still was, just, he just continued. It's, he's in, Gregor Towns is in a difficult spot. He is. I still just have no idea how he is still head coach of Scotland mm -hmm. at this point. Like this is the final straw. It, it would be... Doubly embarrassing now if Ireland got beaten by Scotland next week. It would already be embarrassing because they're Scotland and, and they're in a bad place. And we've already hammered them at the last mm. World Cup and last year in the Six Nations. But it would be doubly embarrassing. Like you look at um, Finn Russell's comments after the England game last year when they came from behind to draw the game with that insane match at the end of uh, Six Nations. What did he say? And he says, I think I actually had an argument with Gregor Townsend. I said, you're telling us to kick, and when we kick, they're just running us back and cut us open. And when we run, they're just hitting us behind the game line and winning the ball back. So in the first half, we got caught off guard with England. And then in the second half, we just came out and had nothing to lose. We just played our rugby, we played well, kicked out of our half and scored some great tries. I think we just played good Scottish rugby in the second half, essentially suggesting that we went away from Townsend's game plan and yeah. we ended up playing the best rugby we've seen from Scotland in the last couple of years. They had a terrible World Cup. The Scottish team have not been any better for the Townsend era. And it is remarkable that they go into another year with him as head coach yeah, and now they've lost their best player enough. but Finn, I'm not for, well, one, I'm not for, one, from him? I'm not like, for one second suggesting that Finn Russell what he's done here is right you should respect the head coach you should respect the office of the person who is running the team but I, th I think this is a big two fingers to the head coach and this is the first semblance of a guy who is starting to lose the dressing room here and it's unfortunate that he's found himself in this position he came in with a great profile into the role of head coach but it just hasn't gone to plan. Yeah, but if I'm Gregor Townsend after Finn Russell says that publicly, I'm like, that is totally out of order, right? So we don't know that those conversations haven't already taken place where they're like, listen, dude, you are, this is last straw stuff. We really want to keep you involved. You're our standout player. Obviously going into the Six Nations with you there is the best possible thing we can do. But if you step out of line again, that's it, you're done. So, like, there could be the context of all that stuff. And by all accounts, like, those comments are ludicrous. Like, they're, they're, to say that stuff publicly is not right. Like he needs to be saying that stuff in the private. He should be saying that stuff, definitely saying it, but in the privacy of the uh, video meeting at the Monday, or like, geez, look how we responded with this thing. Like, there's another way to go about it. There's a real immaturity about somebody who decides that I'm going to convey this message to the head coach by doing this in the media. Yeah, for sure. Think. And like, I think there's also a whole element of this when you look at the players and their performances, say against Ireland in the World Cup, when they were. To be honest with you, pathetic. Mm. Who was the starting out half for Scotland that day when he got hammered 27-3 by Ireland? Finn Russell. Mm. So, like, it's there is a lot of embarrassment to go around here for Scottish rugby over the last 12 months. Gregor Townsend hasn't covered himself in glory. Finn Russell hasn't covered himself in glory. But unfortunately, the reality of professional sport is that the player will always win. 
Townsend's head is on the block. Russell will come back in for the next campaign. We'll probably see Finn Russell at his peak once again. Well, hopefully we do from a neutral perspective in the Scottish jersey. But right now they're at an unbelievably low ebb. And it was 27-3 in the World Cup. Wouldn't be surprised to see a bigger battering next week. But points? I will qualify that by saying my Six Nations predictions have always embarrassed me <laughs> yeah, rather than anybody else. I think you're not going out on a limb with this one, though. This is like, uh, you know... This is not like predicting Italy are going to win the Six Nations. But I'll let you have the final say point, Is it a 12-point spread? Is that pre-Finn Russell being, having too many drinks? I don't get uh, caught up in Six Nations spread conversations anymore after what happened against England last year. What was that? What was that? It was when I said we need to get used to being superior oh, as a yes, rugby yeah, nation yeah, yeah. and England battered us. Um, and I'm also enjoying Simon Zebo's uh, social posts off the back of all this. Yeah, so. the, the like button has been going pretty, pretty healthily for yeah, Finn Russell yeah, over the last 24 hours. Yeah, no, it's good. Good. Right, 8.24 on this uh, Friday morning. Do keep your comments coming into us uh, wherever it is that you're uh, watching this morning. Delighted to have your company. Gary Breen is going to be up next, but first, before that, we've uh, for some time I've had a steady stream of requests to ask John Giles about that time. You'll have seen the YouTube clip, if you haven't, look it up. The time that he lamped uh, Kevin Keegan uh, in the Charity Shield. John was in for an extended chat with Nathan last night, so we did just that. Speaking of Liverpool, uh, whenever we say you're coming in for uh, a longer chat, uh, the one question that comes up time and time again, John, the one thing people want to talk about, and I know you've spoken about it before, punching Kevin Keegan. Well, that, well, that was, yeah, that was in the... That was the, his fault, the, wasn't it? The, the Champions... Uh, sorry, it was in the... Charity, Charity what Shield. Was called the Charity Shield. Mm. Uh, I think that was in 1974. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kevin... Well, Kevin was a terrific player. I mean, he, he, he got Liverpool back on track. Really, when he came to the mm. club, he was he was a terrific player. But that day on the on the on the, the Charity Shield, what was the Charity Shield? He seemed to be in a bit of a mood. Right. You know, I know the ball went to Norman Hunt, and he, and he wasn't and very unlike him. He had a go at Norman Hunt, and then the ball broke, and he had a go, go at Billy, and then it broke again, and I got onto it, going towards Terry Cooper, and he was all over me. You know, over the back of me, down the backs of my legs, over the top. Of me. He was in a bit of a temper, and I. Shouldn't have done what I did. I he let him come past me, and I actually did hit him. You know, he was. Oh, you, oh, you hit him. <laughs> and lucky enough, I did. Matthews, Matthewson was the referee, and uh, I played it. You know, he was. He was. I got. On, I got on well with him, and he came up and I said, "Sorry about that." You know, <laughs> and he let me off. But lucky, there was a few Liverpool players around. Mm. I, they didn't say anything. I think Kevin was in. They it, might have sensed as well that there was just something up at him. Up at him, and they, right. maybe maybe they thought like it, maybe he was a bit maybe he was a bit moody, and they, they might have thought when well, you deserve to get that. I think what John is saying that the Liverpool players were quietly delighted that John Giles <laughs> had decked their teammate. <laughs> oh, I love I love that image as well. Though it's just God, you wouldn't mess with any single one of those players Oof. on that pitch at that time. Certainly, John Giles is not the guy to mess with. It's just and it was like that furious turnaround of like. Let's get Andy Lee's analysis of that, actually. It'd be good. We must do that sometime. Right. Uh, we're going to talk uh, Premier League in just a moment and as well get some reaction to the news that Niall Quinn is the new deputy, uh, the interim deputy CEO of the FAI. Here he is speaking to, we mentioned a bit earlier on, Tommy Martin of Virgin Media. It is interim and it is for a short period of time, we believe. Uh, but in that period of time, it's very important that a strategy is developed in those pillars that uh, everybody is feeding into and everybody feels it's the correct thing. So that whoever comes afterwards and whenever they come, that they're not starting all over again. I've stepped over the line because I believe it will be good and it'll be good enough. I, uh, that's not that I know any of the figures involved. I don't know uh, where it will end up when it finally uh, is announced. I hope it's announced very, very soon. But I'm led to believe that there is uh, an assistance in place from, from the, the three stakeholders, the banks, uh, UEFA and the government, that will allow the game to move forward. All right, 8.28, Gary Breen, good morning to you. Good morning. What do you, uh, what do you think of this, this latest news, Noel Quinn appointed at the FAI? I think it's good. I think um, to have someone like Niall there who has experience uh, scenarios like that in terms of what he did at Sunderland, um, in terms of being around the boardroom, decision-making process, I'm glad that someone like him is in there. I think he'll wear his heart on his sleeve. I think he'll do what is best for the FAI and for everyone associated with it and obviously ultimately for Ireland. So I think it's a positive step. Yeah, it definitely has been sort of roundly received in that way. Like, the difficulty is that we were discussing a bit earlier on that there is still a bit of an unknown quantity about Niall Quinn and the business side. We don't know 
uh, the inner details of Niall's uh, business acumen. Obviously, you mentioned Sunderland. We've seen the, the evidence of that up close and personal from an Irish perspective about the yeah. capacity he had there to unite a town that was on its knees from a football perspective and uh, the impact that that had on, on the society in general when, when he went in there. Um, and, you know, you used the expression, obviously, the heart is heart in a sleeve. They're going to need, the FBI is in a dire 60 million yeah. plus debt. They're going to need more than that. Yeah, listen, certainly, but uh, I'm under no illusions. I don't think that Noel's going to attempt to do it on his own. I think he'll tap into people who have more experience in those areas, and that's what he is good at doing, finding people who uh, uh, that is their skill set. I think he'll have he'll have the ear of certain people. So I hope I hope it goes well. Listen, I I, I, quite, I keep saying to you guys before, and I don't think that a, um, a brilliant footballer makes a brilliant manager because it's a totally different remit, and I get your point in terms of what Noel has done in his career previously, that this is, is a different skill set required. But I believe that he'll surround himself with people who can make a difference. Yeah, I think that everybody wants to see that uh, that outcome and headed in the right direction as well. So we'll watch uh, over the next number of months and see how it all falls out. Uh, on the pitch, obviously, uh, Liverpool getting it done again last night, Gary. this ruthless streak in them. Even when last night like they could have easily drawn that game, they maybe should have lost yeah. it, ground it out. How many times have we... Yeah, Adrian, how many times have we said that this season, that the game has been at risk? And I think the opposition always feel that they're in with a chance. But the reality is that none of them have had a chance. And that just shows you just the, the, the quality of this Liverpool team in that uh, they're battle-hardened at a time when Manchester City have become fragile. They, they've just really looked tough. They're seeing games out. They have that brilliance to beat you um, with their quality. But to be able to grind those results is something that we've always heard. It's that stereotype, isn't it, of a title-winning team and... You know, they're exactly that. I, I've been so impressed with them. And if you think about how good they were last year, and I think they've looked a little more vulnerable this year in terms of that high defensive line that teams were able to turn them and they've had opportunities. It felt the opp that the opposition have had far more opportunities against them this year than they did last season, yet they just look like the complete package. I, I, I've just been so impressed with what Klopp's done. It's been an amazing job it's, since the moment he walked in at Liverpool. Yeah, it's their eighth 2-1 win of the season. And yeah. Like, I don't know. I was going to ask you if it's a sign, are Liverpool creaking or... But it surely isn't. At that point, it's the it's the Arsenal 1-0. It's the... Yeah. There, there's more of a plan to it than that. But you know, when, when say, for example, it, it's having that ability to withstand those periods when the opposition are in full flow. Now, think about that equaliser last night at Molyneux. The ground was jumping. But at no point, as much as the momentum Wolves had, at no point did you think that they're going to, you know, they're literally going to go on. And you, you always feel, and I always feel certainly, that Liverpool can go up another gear whenever it's required. And the very fact that they've been able to to play without their goalkeeper at the beginning of the season, Fabinho as well, just shows that players can come in. The one thing I will say though, if Van Dijk is to get injured, I think it would have a, a massive effect. Not necessarily in this season because I think. It's pretty obvious they're going to become the Premier League champions for the first time, on top of being Champions League winners, World Cup champions as such. So everyone's saying about how far can this Liverpool squad go? The reality is that the ceiling has probably been reached because you can't win any more than they've won. I think the challenge for them now is sustaining it over a period of two, three seasons and going down and, and matching the, the iconic teams of the Premier League. But in, in isolation in terms of the performances this season and the potential points total that they're going to get, they could be argued as the best Premier League team we've seen. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely outrageous, Gary. It's interesting, like, it's, if you take Van Dijk out of the team, if you take anybody's best player out of the, th of the team, it's going to make a huge impact, especially if it's a, a centre-back. At the same yeah, time... Yeah, look at Laporte at City, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's... And, like, you wouldn't even class Laporte as Manchester City's most important player, whereas Van Dijk, probably, you can make an argument that he is for Liverpool. Like, you, at the same time, though, you can kind of think about some of the discourse around someone like Joel Matip in 2019. Very impressive. I know a lot of Liverpool fans were very impressed with, with his performances. And now yeah. it seems that Joe Gomez is coming back to his best as well that I do wonder if we sometimes cautiously don't give the remaining uh, centre-backs at Liverpool the credit they deserve sometimes because it's easy to say that Van Dijk makes them look good perhaps they just are yeah. really bloody good themselves um, I think they're good players but I think if you were to play them without Van Dijk alongside them I don't think they hit those type of levels I think he gives you that type of confidence of course you can't be as good as Liverpool are with just one defender. All, all of that defensive unit has to play a role in that holding midfielder. They all play a role. But he is the player that makes them all better, who elevates the rest of their games. I think I've never really experienced that, only with probably Roy Keane 
in terms of the Irish team, in terms of making everyone that little bit better because of his standards. Not not because he's barking out orders, just his level of performance and, and the security that you have with his, his, his quality in and around you. I genuinely do believe that Laporte is City's best player in terms of his most important because it's been proved. Look how brilliant they have still been offensively this season. De Bruyne has been sensational. Sterling's looking like a, a, such a top player in terms of having that, that finished product at the end. And all the other players, you know, there's so many to mention. But as soon as you take out a resolute defender who's able to repel attacks, it causes all sorts of problems. That offensive unit of Manchester City is so good on the press, the high press. I don't think Guardioli gets enough credit for that. But as soon as you get out past that, it's been proved all season, you're at that Manchester City defence and they can't keep you out. Flip side of that is any time the opposition look to break, look how effortlessly Van Dijk just comes over and puts the ball back into Liverpool's possession. They start another attack. Gomez, I think, yeah, I think it's, a, it's probably the reason why Klopp has decided to go with such a high line because of his recovery pace. But I think he struggled at the beginning of the season, took him a bit of time, and that can happen. Matip, I think, has been a brilliant signing on a free transfer, really has, and always looks composed when I see him play. But you take Van Dijk out of that and put Matip, um, Gomez, whatever combination, Lovren at the back, Liverpool don't look as good. Yeah, the inevitability of it all at this stage of the year is absolutely mad. It's going to allow us, though, the beauty of it is, Gary, it's going to allow us to have a lot of other hypothetical conversations over the next while right. just to fill the airtime, <laughs> including, <laughs> you've touched on it, and maybe you've given your answer already to this, but uh, the Liverpool, the, the player of the year is going to come from Liverpool, obviously. Um, there's three or four, maybe five names, players at this stage. If we were to stop the season now, who is that for you? I think in terms of, I think probably those Liverpool players, we're so impressed with so many, of course we have, in terms of what, what they've achieved. Obviously, I've, I've always talked so glowingly about Van Dijk, but you can't ignore Mane. We're hearing Liverpool fans say it's the best left winger they've had since John Barnes. And his ability to, to, to continuously play games, I know he's potentially got injured last night, but if you talk about the schedule that he's had over the last couple of seasons, it's incredible. And his level performances as well. I think he's probably the main man in that offensive unit ahead of Salah now. I know Firmino plays such a key role that so many of those Liverpool players struggle to replicate. But it, it literally is, you could pick so many of them, but Would you in give isolation... Henderson, Henderson a shake of it, Gary? Oh, like yeah. Is, 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 is that just based on, the, on him playing so far above himself or actually is it just a, is it a credible discussion? Oh, it's, without a doubt, it's a credible discussion. To the extent now that you're going to have to put him in the same category as Stephen Gerrard, Graham Souness as iconic Liverpool captains. I mean, he's, he's, he's going to lift trophies that Gerrard never lifted and stuff like that. And, and what's been impressive about Henderson is that it was such a difficult path, wasn't it, at Liverpool? Essentially replacing Gerrard. But even in isolation, the very fact that Brendan Rodgers was talking about maybe moving him on initially, going to Fulham or something like that. But he said, no, he refused to accept that got his head down and, and, and such a pivotal player. And I would argue as well, when he plays in that advanced position in midfield and plays to that right-hand side, these deliveries and his contribution have been brilliant. But I would argue more than that is that if he plays holding midfield role instead of Fabinho, I, I think he's actually a bit better in terms of his mobility. I don't think no one skips past him in a way that N'Golo Conte skipped past Fabinho for that Chelsea goal. So, I, I, exactly, I think there is an argument and I think you probably add to the fact that he's the captain, he's the leader and how his stock has, has risen so so strongly over the last couple of seasons. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Roy Keane a bit earlier on. No football conversation is complete without mentioning his name, obviously. Mm. Um, he lit it up at the weekend himself and Jamie Carragher, this conversation about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and sort of how long he should be given. And He's on one of the worst runs of all time of any Manchester United manager. Do you give him time at this stage or are things so dire you got to make changes? Listen, I, I, I'd never call, and I never have done, call for any manager to be sacked as such, but... I think the question you've got to ask is, if, if, if you want to give a manager time, do you feel like you're on the right pathway? And if you do, then continue. I know people have con quite often said, well, listen, Ferguson needed time to get it right. You know, he had to win that FA Cup game, Mark Robinson's goal, that famous goal, essentially. But the reality is he was a serial winner. He broke the old firm monopoly in Scotland with Aberdeen. He won in Europe with Aberdeen. He had a proven track record. Solskjaer has none of that going into Manchester United and being their manager. Now, if anyone wants to put an argument forward in terms of the fours and against, put it forward on Solskjaer and don't mention his playing career. Don't mention that and just... Mm focus on his managerial career. Now, people will say straight away, he'd done very well at Mulder. Yes, he did. 
And that gets you the opportunity to get a Premier League job. It gets you the Cardiff job. It doesn't get you the Manchester United job. And then if you then fail at Cardiff, how do you then get a Manchester United job? It doesn't make any sense to me. I think he's been fortunate. I thought he'd done a brilliant job in terms of reconnecting the club. But I do forget, think that they made the decision far too early. And I'm looking at it now and I don't see or believe that this is going to get any better. And it's certainly not going to get Manchester United back to where they believe they belong. Yeah, There's an amazing opportunity for any manager to come in till the end of the season, though, Gary, given how crap everybody is around them and given the opportunity there for a top four place. <laughs> Well, listen, the opportunity for a top four place is certainly there in terms of the struggles that Arsenal have, the inconsistency of Chelsea. And obviously, uh, Mourinho has not really got his stamp on Tottenham just yet. But I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't advocate. I, I think it would be foolhardy for Manchester United to, to make the decision now. I think they should just do it in the summer. I, I think they'll obviously be... Um, they wouldn't be doing their job properly behind the scenes if they weren't making contact with other managers. People might say that's um, a little bit sly, but that's just all the business world. You have to have plans in place. But I just look at the scenario and I, I, I just don't, I don't see a, a Manchester United team that can play any other way other than counter-attack. And if you don't play and don't, or are not allowed to play, it's probably why they get the good results against the big teams because the big teams are expansive, want to open up the game a bit so they're able to counter-attack. The lesser teams put a defensive block on, United can't play through it. And now you take out their main asset in Rashford, I think it's going to be a tough time for Manchester United. Who, who is going to win the slow bike race, in your view, and grab fourth position? You just don't know. And at one stage, I thought Chelsea were doing very well, but they just keep shooting themselves in the foot. Arsenal, I don't believe, will be in and around it. I think Arteta initially goes in, as you all know, Owen. Does a good job. It looks like he's, he's amending certain scenarios. Certainly that performance against Manchester United, he got his team playing to their strengths as opposed to their weaknesses. But the problem is, is that those weaknesses will, will come to the surface again. And it's been proved it. If you continue to go back to Mustafi, if you continually go back to Xhaka, you will get the same results we've had over the last three or four seasons. They're not going to change. They're not at the level required to play for Arsenal. And the problem is, is that Arteta wants Xhaka to play in midfield. And I can understand why. He's a central midfielder who can play on a half turn, who can receive balls and then play. And more importantly, he can break lines with his passes. Now, if you have a midfielder who can do that, then you can get Ozil into the game. If you play Guendouzi and Torreira ahead of Xhaka, you've got centre midfielders who can't get Ozil on the ball. And if you can't get Ozil on the ball, you might as well be down to 10 pen. Yeah, it's very true. 10 points off fourth place at the moment. I personally think Spurs are still in, in with a great shout of getting the top four. The conversation around Tottenham this week, though, has obviously had an Irish tint with Jose Mourinho's comments on Troy Parrott saying he's nowhere near the, to, the, the level to play first-team footballer to start and lead the line, I should say, for Spurs right now, which I guess he's kind of right in, in one way, given his age and the kind of unfair comparisons you can make between players of his age and other players of his age, given their position and given the fact that you're not replacing yeah. Harry Kane when you're uh, generally coming in to, to start in the Premier League at 17 or 18 years of age. When, and of course, if you think about all those successful Jose Mourinho teams, it's a physical presence at the centre for be it Drogba, mm. Costa, those type of guys, Lukaku. I think Troy Parrott, and, and I said it to you guys in pre-season, saw a lot of him, and I thought I was so, so impressed with his physicality as a 17-year-old. The way he was able to bump small in all over the place when they played against United. He was able to muscle the Inter Milan. But to do it consistently in the Premier League at his age is a massive ask. And, and I, I don't think many players could. Certainly Harry Kane couldn't do it at that age. So it, I, I, it does make sense what he's saying. I, it'd be great that he would be able to build up his minutes and get games, but... Perhaps he may well go have to play somewhere and, and learn his trade, but there's no doubt in his talent. And I think Mourinho has identified that he's a special, special young player, but not quite ready. Great stuff, Gary. Enjoy the weekend. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. Good Thanks luck. Gary Breen on the line there, uh, head of the weekend, Premier League, and uh, plenty of other things as well. Um, Brian has been in touch. Uh, Brian Lavin says when City beat Watford 8 0 early in the season, Klopp said he'd prefer 8 1 nils than an 8 0. He actually made two ones. He's right. Yeah, it's uh, certainly something that Klopp is subscribing to, and it's just you couldn't. It seems that like you can't control this. So how, how do you manage to win yeah. all these games in that manner? It's just there's not. There's not the one nil is obviously a very controlled thing. The two one, I mean, the two yeah. one where you've been one one. There's, there's a bit more panic about that than there is control. But it, there doesn't seem to be any panic. There just seems to be just a, a sense of belief that no matter what happens over these next few minutes, we will find a winner. 
Um, and Keenan Manny says, the best Premier League team ever. Hardly. City last season alone were better. Annihilated teams. Invincibles and Mourinho's first Chelsea, both better as well. I don't know. Let's wait until the end of the season. They could end up winning the league by 115 points. And at that point, you'd probably have to concede that they were head and shoulders, limbs, knees, toes above everybody else. So we'll see. Uh, right, it is 8.44 on this Friday morning. Rugby coming your way. Andy Dunn standing by to look ahead to the Six Nations. A few interesting uh, talking points in there as well. So that's coming your way very shortly. But before that, we've a brand new podcast for you all. Uh, the OTB Classic Games Club. It's a bit like a book club. Uh, but for epic sporting events, episode one will revisit Dublin and Kerry's era-defining 2013 All-Ireland semi-final clash. Here are some of the uh, trends we picked up on in that match. The full show will be up in the OTB Highlights podcast stream uh, and YouTube later today. Kerry were cynical, Dublin were cynical, because being cynical was something that you could be at the time, and pulling down players in certain areas was something you had to do. Like, Jack Shore comes onto the pitch, and the first thing he does is pull down uh, one of his opposition players. So I'm not for one second saying that it was one county or the other. It was just on show. And one of the things that I picked as the thing that was trending at, at this point, I'm not sure what you've got. I'm, like, I'm sure you've spotted that as well. There's no haircuts? No, no, it was... No, no the, jer- the jerseys weren't quite as tight. No. <laughs> like, it's only, yeah, Philly yeah, it's only six like, years ago, but yeah. it, 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 how young a lot of these yeah. players look. Like, Philly looks like a different yeah. person. Totally different person. Michael Darren McCauley's short hair, I was like, th- this, he looks so different. You know, yeah. you, you see him now, he's like a, like a Hollywood movie star, isn't he? Jack that? McCaffrey looks like he's about 12. Yeah. <laughs> he still does. <laughs> like, a, a trend of the time, uh, was it a trend? I, I'm not sure if it was a trend or the, one of the more jarring facts that... Keno Sullivan was like inside the opposition half. Well, this is something on that Steve has picked up on as well. Regular basis. Yeah. He's just marauding forward. I'm like, <laughs> who is this guy? Yeah. Tomas just O'Shea. sit there in the pocket. I thought Tomas O'Shea looked like he looked like the quintessential 1990s Premier League footballer. He had the shirt tucked in. You know, he, th- he was actually looked a bit like Roy Keane. He was like, if you see Roy Keane and he had the, the shorts up really high. I was like, get this old man off the field, he's past it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, was, there was one moment when he, when he tried chasing Dean Connolly and then he was down on his... Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what upper. were they doing? They had Mark O'Shea and Tomas O'Shea on one side, like with 33 and 35, weren't they, at the time? There was three debutants, three or three, you know, players who had only made their championship debut that... Like it really was, it was they were they were up against. That's it. actually one thing that next day commented on in commentary was that uh, everybody's marking each other by the program. Like nobody had actually <laughs> yeah. thought of. I, I don't know it's, it's 2013, so like Let's move. Yeah, like it's, yeah. it's recent. People had done that, but they just decided to, to play by that. Uh, you mentioned most jarring. The most jarring moment for me in the game was Kieran Kilkenny getting the ball by the sideline, and what Kieran Kilkenny does now is hand pass the ball back, mm. loop around, get the ball, hand pass the ball back again. But he had a pot shot. From the sideline, he, got, he gets taken off later in the game. Maybe uh, Mr. Gavin was, was unhappy with his star <laughs> pupil. Uh, yeah, that is the uh, brand new podcast from Off the Ball, the OTB Classic Games Club. Um, there'll be I understand in, by episode twelve we're going to do some non Kerry stuff. I don't know oh, if that's God, it's I, a rumor, no Tom, that. or if that's no actually, way. You might be surprised to hear that in that Kerry Dublin episode there was a lot of mayo talk. I will be not in the slightest bit surprised if that happened. The at plant all. was there yeah. in the middle, yeah. The, what was the Nathan's point okay so anybody who, who wants a reason to listen to this or perhaps not listen to this Nathan Murphy made the point that if Kerry had won the All-Ireland in 2013 or won that game in 2013 that semi-final against Dublin Mayo would have become the dominant team of the decade no not Kerry or Dublin <laughs> Mayo would have become the dominant team of the decade Mayo who finished up with a grand total of zero All-Irelands in the decade by dint of the fact of another team winning a different semi-final that they weren't involved in would have then become the dominant team of the decade all Mayo ever there. have watch it all Mayo it. ever have are ifs they're the champion ifs the champion ifs yeah. Tom good morning to you hey how's it going tennis tennis yeah uh, Serena Williams has been knocked out of the Australian Open so the 38 year old American lost 6-4 6-7 to China's Wang Zhang in the third round of the ladies singles in Melbourne overnight Williams remains one victory shy of Margaret Court's record of 24 Grand Slam titles and realistically they look looks less and less likely now what everybody wants to see her do it yeah for lots of reasons yeah, but my, I mean, she going to do it in France? For, for, where's Wimbledon? How many Australian Open titles has she got? Nine, seven or nine, I'm not 100% sure, but... Uh, yeah, anyway, it's, look, 
it's more retirements as well because uh, Carolyn Wozniacki's called time in her career after she lost in three sets earlier to Tunisia's Onjabur. Top seed Ashley Barty is into the third round. Out on court at the moment, uh, Coco Goff, 15 years old, of course, she's up against Naomi Osaka. It's 4 3. She leads all going with serve there. And meanwhile, on the men's side of the draw on court at the moment, uh, tie the round really. Stefano Tsitsipas and Milos Raonic are out in the Margaret Court Arena. Tsitsipas, uh, they're 4 3 up in that one. Just finished, Marion Cilic knocked out. Out. Ninth seed Roberto Batista Agut in five sets, six seven, six four, six love, five seven, six three. While earlier in the men's singles, title holder Novak Djokovic is into the last 16 with a straight sets win over Yoshihiti Nishioka, while Roger Federer will be on court shortly. He plays John Millman later. Liverpool, meanwhile, have now collected 67 points for a possible 69 as they close in on their Premier League title. Roberto Firmino scored late as the Reds beat Wolves 2-1 at Molyneux last night. Saido Manu did pick up a injury, though, muscle injury. The extent of that will be determined later on. But Reds boss Jurgen Klopp was happy with his players' conditioning as they fought to the end. If the boys would not be in the shape we, they are and we have no chance to, to, to win football games in that league, everybody wants to beat us, obviously. Um, so they are all in, in an outstanding shape. Well, Manchester United will go to Tranmere Rovers in the FA Cup on Sunday after Tranmere shocked Watford, winning 2-1 last night at Prenton Park. Tranmere manager Mickey Mellon says their FA Cup tie against Manchester United could be a huge turning point for the club. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, uh, it's what we probably needed today to move the club forward. We needed to get a, get a massive tie in order to try and move the club forward again because things are tight here. We, I understand that as much as anybody. But uh, we must take this opportunity, I believe, now and try and move things forward. Uh, meanwhile, in Gov's Dubai Desert Classic, Graham McDowell is level par in the closest stage of his second round. Eddie Purple and South African Dean Burmester share the lead there in eight under. Port Carrington and Shane Lowry begin their second rounds uh, from one under and level par. Both are just teed off. Uh, Roy McElroy, he started well. The Farmers Insurance Open on the PGA Tour in California. Five under par 67 is just leaves him one shot off the pace held by Keegan Bradley and Sebastian Kaplan. Tiger Woods, three under par, but McElroy says he's happy with his lot after the first. Right. 67 was it was a nice was a nice start I, I drove the ball really well if I can drive the ball like that for the rest of the week and the rest of this year I'd be pretty happy uh, iron play was okay um, overall for you know first first uh, round back for the new year it was it was pretty good and Hurling Henry Shefflin has stepped down as manager of Ballyhale Shamrocks less than a week after leading the Kilkenny Senior Club to All-Ireland uh, glory. The 10-time All-Ireland winner uh, with the Cats is to spend more time with his family. And the sports facing later from Dundalk, the first goes to post at 5 o'clock. And just there, in an update on the tennis, Coco Goff has actually taken that first set against the holder, Naomi Osaka. Thanks, Tom. 8.50 on this uh, Friday morning. It's uh, rugby next and lots to get into. The company of Andy Dunn will be in studio uh, in just a couple of moments' time. But Tom English joined a very special Thursday night rugby last night uh, along with Nathan to try and shed some light on Finn Russell's exit from the Scottish camp. Trying to piece together the, the pieces um, as the day has gone on, Nathan. Um, I mean, you say he was sent home. There's, there's some dubiety over that, whether he was sent home or if he walked out. Right. Um... Listen, I mean, it's, there's been difficulties between Finn Russell and Gregor Townsend going back a little while. I think they kind of came to a head at half time in the last game of the Six Nations mm. at Twickenham. Scotland were annihilated in the first half. I think they were 31 points to seven down at the break. There was a big uh, contretemps in the dressing room between the two of them. I think they went into a side room in the Twickenham dressing rooms and they had it out and. At the time, it was kind of, because of the recovery, Scotland made a great recovery and ended up drawing the match. At the time, it was kind of downplayed as a kind of things that happen in the midst of a crisis to honest guys uh, getting involved in a heated debate for mm. the good of the team. I think, it was, I think it was a lot more serious than that. And I think it was uh, the kind of first, as we understood it anyway, the first manifestation of difficulties in the relationship between the two of them. Um, and today, we've, we've, this catastrophic news for Scotland is that he's gone. He's not going to be playing against Ireland. Will he be playing for the rest of the Six Nations? We don't know. Does he want to play in the rest of the Six Nations under Gregor Townsend? We don't know. Does Gregor Townsend want him back? We don't know that either. So there's an awful lot still uh, to be clarified in all of this. Andy Don, a very good morning. Good morning. That's oh. interesting. Yeah. This 
breakdown in relationship isn't just an immediate you ain't drinking therefore you're out of the squad sort of thing that's probably the reason why he's out of the squad but yeah. this goes back to that England game last year when you look at some of the comments that's come out and Finn Russell is basically saying you're holding us back your style of play is holding us back we're going to go out and play our way and we all saw what happened in the second half of that game yeah it's a, to me it's really surprising because um I, I would have thought Finn Russell was is a very similar style player to Gregor Townsend was himself as a player. Um, and Townsend got a lot of his success by playing a very exciting brand of rugby with Glasgow initially. Um, he also had uh, experience away from Northern Hemisphere rugby as a player and a coach in, in Natal at one stage towards the tail end of his playing career. So he's had a quite a diverse <coughs> Uh, introduction to coaching himself and a lot of his teams play a, a pretty open flowing brand of rugby so it seems like a little bit of a contradiction in terms that Russell is saying you're holding us back however um, the second half in Twickenham at 38-7 down and sc- going on and scoring I think 31 or 31-7 or something whatever it was I mean they scored they scored the best part of 30 odd points 35 points unanswered um, in an electric yeah, uh, period of play. Um, a lot of it, I would, I, I would, I would suppose, veer towards positivity, and in fact, it was incredibly good Scottish play as opposed to porous English defence in that forty-minute period. And if that type of play was born out of an argument at half time from your, I suppose, your lead strategist on field and your head coach, and it's it's so opposite to how they played in the first half. There's there's obviously. Uh, no smoke without fire so um, mm. there's something going on there yeah just like to return to those quotes if you missed it at the top of the show what Finn Russell said was I said you're telling us to kick and when we kick they're just running it back and cut us open and when we, when we run it they're hitting us behind the gain line and winning the ball back like that's fairly damning stuff mm. of a coach to me that seems like a, a fairly basic thing to diagnose on the pitch when you're sitting up in the stands yeah, um, and I'm I'm sure it's not. It's never that simple. It's never sure. uh, as as binary as that. But um, it's probably just a clash that's been building up under the surface for a while. I think it happens a lot with senior players. I think um, very often a player will maybe have that conversation in private mm. in a much more gentle fashion. But obviously Russell's a bit more rock and roll. He's that <laughs> maverick attitude. Um, you know, he's, there's there's reports he's gone out drinking and not turned up training. So there's an element of that, that maverick in him, um, and he obviously sees it. He doesn't see a huge issue in coming out and criticising his coach in public. I don't think it would ever be done, or certainly hasn't been done much in the last twenty, thirty years by an Irish player. Um, so yeah, but I do think it happens, and I think it's fair. It's probably welcomed in a in a professional squad where people will question things. I recently heard Stuart Lancaster talk um, about how they've got very diverse views in their coaching team. A lot of a lot of different views um, from the likes of Robin McBride coming in, Felipe from Argentina, Stuart from England, and Leo uh, from born and bred in Dublin. So. Mm. Um, very, very diverse views in that where a couple of years ago they maybe had Leo, John Fogarty and Gervin Dempsey, possibly all from the Irish coaching school of uh, tactics and strategy and technical play. But the diversity they've brought into that Leinster group feeds a little bit of argument, feeds a bit of healthy debate and I think that's probably important for success. I don't think it's that important to do it spread across national media after having about nine pints or, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's slightly different uh, in terms of the, de- the delicacy with which Russell has delivered this uh, <laughs> bombshell. Is it a situation now where you would be surprised to see Gregor Townsend as head coach of Scotland, say, come the autumn series? Like, it, it, there were a lot of questions in the Scottish media after the World Cup performances. Cause, like, that <clears> performance <throat> against Ireland, we all know, was shocking from Scotland. They've been, they've been pretty abject. It's uh, been a huge disappointment uh, for me and for a lot of people watching them based on the anticipation we had with, with Townsend taking over and the style of play he plays. Um, but it's, inc- it's entirely dependent on the results in the next few weeks. I mean... Mm-hmm. Roy Keane walked out in Saipan and uh, Mick McCarthy's Irish team played some of the best football they played in years back in 02. So um, it does, I mean, it's, 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 a cold, it's a cold old profession in that uh, Russell could walk out the door and they might end up playing a little better as a collective unit. He's, uh, he's notoriously unpredictable. That can have huge benefits, but can also have drawbacks when half your team don't know what you're going to do either. Mm-hmm. So 
Um, while I am a, a fan, I think he brightens up the game. He makes rugby fun and interesting to look at. There is an argument that they may be a more settled squad. Townsend gets a greater degree of control over how the team plays overall uh, and other players respond and step up. And again, I suppose there is history and an example of the likes of the, the Keane and Saipan issue where apparently the best and most important player leaves and the team end up playing better. So um, I, I would be, I mean, I would hold judgment on Townsend until we see a couple of results. Fair enough. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Leinster there and the different voices that we've seen in the camp over the last couple of years, how it's led to not only great results on the pitch, but also a brand of rugby, which I think most Irish rugby fans wouldn't be disappointed to see tried out with the national team. What's your sense of that? Is there a possibility that we do see this happen uh, with an Ireland team, first of all? But actually, before we get into that, perhaps just explain, in your view, the vast differences that we sometimes see between Leinster and Ireland. Um, well, I, in recent years, um, I suppose they, they weren't entirely dissimilar about four or five years ago. At, at one stage, Schmidt was playing a very open game in Leinster where they used the full width of the field. I think um, Joe, for reasons unknown, uh, the game plan tightened up and continued to tighten up over time. And we ended up seeing an Irish side that would have multiple ball carries, for example, but very little uh, yardage gained in, in aggregate yardage or metres. So we might get an Irish side that carried, you know, 120, 130 times into contact, but, you know, the sum, the aggregate would be, you know, two metre, three metre carries per player, and we're not making a huge amount of ground. Um, also playing in a very kind of a narrow um, usage of the field. So the difference would have been with Leinster um, under Leo and Lancaster, notably in the last couple of seasons, using the entire width of the field, um, creating space between defenders, um, encouraging more, a bit more offloads um, out of the tackle. Um, as a result, what you're seeing is less carries uh, per player, more, more metres gained, um, probably not holding the possession for as long in periods. Um, so it's a little more risky to play that way, but it's a, it's a style that would be quite common now, uh, Japan play that way, uh, New Zealand play that way. Um, so there are probably some of the key differences. I think um, in reality, Farrell has a very, very similar attacking coaching mindset to Lancaster. And as a result, I think where even the non-Leinster Irish fans, you know, the Munster, Ulster, Connacht fans who might look on with Leinster at times and, and, uh, and begrudge them the odd win or success, I think they might look at the style and say, w would be nice to see an Irish side play that way. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite feasible. Um, they're they're Because um, that's our idea here that we just don't have the players, only no, the people do. from Fiji and New Zealand can play like no, that. No, I, I think absolutely. This, it, it's not about playing kind of unlimited uh, circus rugby, you know. it's um, There's got to be a discipline to it, there's got to be a responsibility for players on the ball to make decisions and the right decisions. But I think players are very much empowered to make decisions without a very, very uh, restrictive or prescriptive style of play from, from the top level uh, down. So I think it's quite likely we'll see an adoption of that more open style because Farrell and Lancaster have come, have, they've worked together mm. um, in reverse for England, obviously, uh, Andy, Andy Farrell was Stewart's assistant. So I think the likelihood is that there'll probably be a bit more of groupthink going on in a good way from the provinces leading through to the Irish setup. I think what was happening in the, the latter periods for, for Schmidt in Ireland was he, he was very, very, um, I suppose, belligerent about how that Irish team were going to continue playing. Um, we didn't evolve after that New Zealand win um, and we did poor Six Nations, which we ended up trying to stick with the game plan and do it better and execute it better was probably the wrong thing. It's easy to say that in hindsight, but um, what was happening is some of the provincial teams were playing a different way. I mean, probably the biggest irony of all of this is that Leinster played a very limited and prescriptive game in the Saris European Cup final, which was against their nature and ended mm. up losing as a result. So I think that's a huge frustration for Leo, for Stewart and for all, the whole Leinster squad as they went away from their nature in that final, whether they did it by choice or because Saracens exerted too much pressure. 
um, we'll never really know. Because I remember being on the radio with you that day and you were saying Irish rugby as a whole just needs to get over this whole box kicking thing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a plight on Irish development, uh, at, even when they go when they're out there trying to win trophies. Yeah, I mean, like in the last Six Nations in 2019, um, we had the highest percentage average of box kicks for any country participating. So um, the average kicks from our own 22 was about 29 and we averaged 15 box kicks. So over half of all our exit kicks were box kicks. Wales, for example, who won the Grand Slam were under 25% in terms mm. of box kicks. So there's data to back it up. Um, it's, it's a bit of a redundant strategy when it's used to that degree. I mean, it's a good strategy used sparingly, but I think the problem was we started to get into an issue where almost every provincial scrum half and our national scrum halves were just almost exclusively using box kicks to get out of our 22. It's, it's a tactic that um, has, I suppose has run its course and teams are very aware that we use it. Teams are very aware how to disarm it. Um, and I would love to see us in the Six Nations, maybe not overuse it at the very best and avoid it might even be better. It's interesting when we look at all this and it's quite simple to say, well, Joe Schmidt loved his, loved his structure and Ireland yeah. were always going to be in a straight jacket and at times that straight jacket led to a bit of success. Then you look at the Ease in Asewa comments post-World Cup, just brushing up on them this morning. Like he was speaking about the 17-18 season, mentioning that once Leinster started playing an attacking brand of rugby and the majority of the Ireland squad was Leinster-based, they let a little bit of that Leinster flair infiltrate <coughs> the camp. Joe started to go away from his tried and trusted drills and introduce a bit of what we call unstructured play that came into Ireland camp in training and in the Six Nations. They were throwing offloads, there was continuity to their play. That got them all the way to the top uh, and an unbeaten year, of course, with all those trophies. Post that, I hear, and this is uh, in the same words, I hear they actually went away from that and started to take it back out and went back to the conservative approach and that's just shone through the whole World Cup and 2019. Mm. Is it as simple as that, that actually it was unstructured play that we were seeing in 2018, it led to the whole success, and for some reason, for some reason uh, Schmidt went back to his, in his view, his tried and trusted uh, techniques? Um, I don't, no, I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's as black and white. I think um, Schmidt was very, very structured, and I think what he started to do was, was lighten up a bit, mm. <clears throat> allow players to... Uh, voice and opinion allow players to steer the direction of the overall group in 2018. And then that didn't happen in before the, the All Blacks game, as I, we now know. I think uh, as we as we as time developed, um, whether Joe felt he 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 uh, he had given too much control to the players, he certainly tried to to wrestle it back. And, um, and was that fair that. enough after what happened against <coughs> Japan? Because that was, uh, according to Rory Bess and according to I think Schmidt himself, the Japan loss actually completely set him back in that belief that the player should be given that control the day before again. Yeah, um, it's, it's, ideally it's the type of thing you'd like, you'd like to think was, would, would have been resolved long ahead of you know, the, how they're going to uh, dish out responsibilities, mm -hmm. roles and responsibilities among the group and among the management. And you'd like to think that's a consistent culture that runs for a period of time over a couple of seasons and everybody's comfortable with that. But it seemed to be very much chopping and changing and who's going to influence uh, how we play. And that's a sure sign of panic in a group to me. Um, and a, and a, a case of uh, the wall is kind of falling down. And it, it's, it's regrettable for such a group that was so successful and talented and for Joe, who had a hugely uh, successful record, but the wheels started to come off, I think, pretty much from that England, first Six Nations England game in February. We had beaten New Zealand, we'd had an incredible 2018, but a, a, a pretty awful start to 2019, and then a, a nine-month period where we we refused to change. Um, Nasiba's comments, I think, are, are very much, they go from black over to white sure. and back again. I, it, the, the answer in reality is somewhere in the middle, but... Um, there's always scope for structure and discipline and coherence among the group. Similarly, there's always opportunity for players to express themselves. And I think the best sides across any sport have a nice mix of both. Scotland at times in that second half, and we mentioned Finn Russell, had gone from one end of the spectrum to the other, had been awful and probably very overly prescribed in the first half and the second half were uh, all flair and brilliance, but if you don't, if you leave them to do that every week, it doesn't happen. Mm. So you've got to find that balance. And I think um, Leinster have seemed to have got 
close to that balance, I think, and, and that's probably one of the key reasons they are successful. Yeah, they're in that beautiful grey area that perhaps in Sarah's comments didn't represent. Yeah. Like, is there anything more to allow us to believe that come next week and the, the weeks that follow, <coughs> that Ireland will also exist in that grey area, except for the fact that we know that Farrell and Lancaster have worked together, and undoubtedly they're on the phone to one another chatting about yeah. rugby ideas. It, but is there anything we've seen in Andy Farrell's time as uh, a coach with Ireland that would suggest that actually it is going to be this sort of new arrival for Irish rugby? Uh, well, no, I suppose plainly. We haven't seen them play a match under him. In terms of what he's said, um, yeah, he, the sound bites we've heard, even Sexton's first interview as, as captain, um, which was very refreshing to see him smiling throughout. Um, to me, that was a good sign. Uh, he seemed quite relaxed and he said that um, while, you know, Joe had given, uh, Sexton argued Joe had given a certain amount of input to players and that was acceptable to Sexton and, and the players at the time. Uh, he said Andy's going to take that to the next level and maybe give the players more responsibility. And I think there is great value in that. I think when you're surrounded by quality and you're surrounded by experience, it's not wise to, const to constantly ignore it or to dampen it down and mm. say, I know I, I'm all powerful and I have the ideas that will we'll win this over. I think it's got to be a collective issue. So for Farrell to, uh, even though they're, they're verbal and they're sound bites, we haven't seen them play together, um, I think he will empower people more and he'll, he'll allow more freedom of expression on the field for those senior players. Um, however, results are the things that matter sure. most. So um, the, the real test for that type of approach is are you prepared to lose a couple of games and continue playing it? And I've often used on here the example of the Argentinian team that destroyed us, dismantled us, even though we had those injuries in the 2015 World Cup quarter final by playing that brand of rugby. They started 18 months prior to that and lost 78-12 to South Africa in one of the first times they tried it. So it can be a gruesome transition, but it's probably worth it in the long run. Yeah, it certainly is. The patience is certainly something that needs to be preached over the next couple of weeks because we will actually be at the end of the next World Cup playing the same way, probably result in a similar result and we will talk about the fact that, well, who cares about the Six Nations? It's all about the World Cup. Mm. Now that it's next week, I think I feel that opinion <laughs> sort of changing, so we need yeah. to kind of roll back a small bit. Um, just in the, the context of the Six Nations, then we just wanted to finally get your thoughts on the Ireland death chart, especially at halfback, and there's only one place to start. It's scrum half. It's probably the most intriguing call of the entire yeah. Six Nations. <clears throat> what way are you calling this? Um, I would pick Cooney if I was the head coach. Um, Murray has actually played better in, in recent months, a lot better than he has maybe in the previous 15, 16 months before that. Um, but I think it's time um, that players who are playing on form regularly at the top of their game are given an opportunity to, to represent the Irish shirt. I think what happened, part of that malaise in the nine months, 10 month period of, of not really changing and not embracing change, even though we were under duress, um, was not picking people on form. I think it would be a statement selection by Farrell to mm. say, um, OK, there's, there is very little between them when they're both on, on top level form, but Cooney deserves a shot. And I think it shakes up what is the established order. And I think if alone that is a statement selection by Farrell, it does not mean Cooney has to start every game. You can also use uh, Murray off the bench. You could start Murray the next week. and. Um, I often refer to, to Jim Gavin's selections in, in the All-Ireland final where he dropped the most established Mick Fitzsimons had six All-Irelands for a relatively unknown own merchant and look what he got out of that. He got two quality players competing for the same position and strengthened his own squad. So I think for me I would almost unequivocally uh, go for Cooney just for the psychology of it and for what it represents um, and a kind of a new departure with the Irish squad and it similarly will help motivate Murray I think hugely as well so um, it's competition is to be welcomed um, and that's the choice I would go for yeah. The form argument makes sense we had Stephen Ferris on the show last week and he was saying that people's form always looks better during a rugby world cup because they're at home they're playing in a weekend they're playing against weekend teams and they have more of an opportunity to shine but then more importantly afterwards people are recovering from the world cup and you've got the, the chance to shine on a european stage for example do you subscribe to that at all that that cooney's form just needs a, a slight asterisk beside it and murray's form the same that perhaps no. the, the world cup hangover is an issue no i don't subscribe to it at all i think form <laughs> is form and you just pick week on week 
um, that's the entire point of picking on form. His form is right now. So, um, yeah, if, if, if you're suffering a bit of fatigue after the World Cup, that's tough. That's what form is, it's a professional game. So, yeah, I think the, uh, I wouldn't agree. Is Conor Murray definitely Ireland's second choice scrum half then in your view? I'd like it. Is there a choice that... Is there a, he's, argu- he's arguably still first choice yeah. in my view. Um, but I'd, I would still pick John Cooney because I think on form currently, if that's not a complete contradiction, I, you know, over the longer term, if Murray keeps playing well, there's a very compelling argument mm. to say, you know, does he play more games in the Six Nations than Cooney? Yeah. I, think, I think Farrell needs to be brave. I think he needs to shake up that Irish squad. I think Rory Best has gone. I think he's got to make important calls around CJ Stander and Peter O'Mahony. He's got to, he's going to, he's made, he's set out his stall with Sexton. So you're talking about five of the kind of key players, the crooks of the team, the fulcrum. One is going to be captain. One has a question mark on selection in terms of Murray. And you've Murray and, um, sorry, you've O'Mahony and Stander who again would have been part of that lead players group in the last nine months whose form has absolutely and routinely been under what their best is and um, he's got to make some big calls and whether he is a bit um, t- hands tied behind the back in terms of back row injuries across provinces he's not he's not tied at nine so um, I think that's his opportunity to make a big call yeah. You don't see Luke McGrath then figuring <coughs> if, if everybody stays fit you've also obviously got Marmion and Blade who've been involved yeah. I guess just to remind your depth chart then I presume McGrath Yeah the, those choice. three names I would say McGrath an ex Marmion and Caelan Blade um, <coughs> all three are, are quite similar players um, all three are very very um, they're pro- all three are probably faster uh, in terms of just ground speed than than Murray and Cooney. All three are, are quite electric around the field on their feet. Um, they're good support runners. Um, I, you know, I, Caelan Blade I'd, before had had looked at his passing. I think that's improved as well. So I think I think we've got quite rude health at nine. I think there's you wouldn't you wouldn't be completely worried if any of them had to play in an international jersey at the moment. I think um, McGrath's had an unfortunate run of injuries as well. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, for me, probably Cooney and, and Murray are a clear front runner and then behind that, that chasing three, um, probably it's up to form on those three as well who gets in. The out half discussion has been transformed entirely <coughs> in the last couple of weeks with yeah. the news that Sexton will be fit for the Six Nations. What's your view on, on that depth chart? Is it a, a huge, huge boost? Of course it is that Sexton mm. is back. Like, How would we have fared without him, I guess, for an entire Six Nations without him? Well, I think it's going to be really interesting to to watch. I, I think Johnny could have a stellar year this year as a 10 if he stays healthy. Uh, hopefully he does. He He's now going to be in a... a it seems to me he's going to be playing in a squad with Leinster when he does play, obviously, with Leinster. I know they wrap him in cotton wool a bit, but he's, he's quite influential to their style. But he's similarly, he's not going to have any small bridges to jump over uh, when he goes into that Ireland squad. I think there's going to be a clarity and a sense of purpose about his game that uh, it crosses over both squads and there won't be any... Uh, to and fro in terms of philosophical. So, you, so you mean cro- bridges to crosses in? He perhaps wouldn't have been entirely comfortable with the style of play, <coughs> ch- switching between two different squads. Yeah, I, I think um, there's going to be a consistency in what he's doing, and I think if he can stay healthy, um, I think the captaincy is a. It's been an interesting pick for him um, because. We saw, for example, last year in his first season with Leinster, you know, how the Munster team really got under his skin. He's it was gonna, great, though. It was brilliant. It was great TV, it was great sport, <laughs> and it's good to see people lose their rag, and, it's, you know, it, it freshens up the game. But I think he's got to be very wary of that, and I'm sure he will be. The teams will probably go after that. Teams will try and rile, rile him up and niggle him. Um, but I actually think if he can stay healthy, I think there's, there's a huge chance for him to show the player he truly is. I think in the first couple of games after the World Cup, he was electric for Leinster. He was outstanding. Now, he picked up that knee injury, but it was, it was as good as I've seen him in a couple of seasons. And I think whether it was the weight of the Irish environment gone or the expectation or the the um, suffocating management of Schmidt or any of the above, I think... He looked like a player reborn. However, his injury profile, as we all know, is, is well documented. Um, and that, that naturally is a frustration. But it would be great to see him get a, a really good, clear run 
uh, this season, yeah. Yeah, in a way, like picking your captain is almost like betting on the winning horse, mm. like just judging the momentum of a player. And yeah. guess what you're saying there, Andy Farron must have spotted it as well, that he's poised to have a big year if he stays fit. Yeah. Making him your captain, you're kind of doubling down on that. Yeah, absolutely. And again, there's, you know, the longer term question is, is, is his body going to last the next four seasons? If it doesn't, do we have to change uh, captain two years in? The re <clears throat> I think the reality is uh, rugby is pretty abrasive and combative and you can't necessarily plan like that because you could set your stall out, pick a young captain, the young captain does a job for three years and gets injured the, you know, the evening before the World Cup and he's sure. out for the World Cup. It's a very tricky thing to do. More likely is he'll have a younger leadership group around Sexton, I would imagine, as opposed to the uh, the older, more established heads. I'm sure he'll shake it up a little bit in that leadership group okay. and they'll learn from each other. So instead of Peter O'Mahony being the, in that, a key <coughs> member of that leadership group, it would be the likes of James Ryan. Yeah, I would have thought there would be at least be an elevation sure. of younger players who haven't been in that leadership group as opposed to uh, maybe a demotion of the incumbents. Okay. But I'm sure they're going to start bringing in a bit of fresh blood and look for new ideas from younger guys. I think they have to. Very briefly then, who's back up to Sexton? I presume it's Ross Byrne in your view. I, th I think at the moment, yeah. yeah most likely Ross. Um, again, very very understated player. Um, brings other players into the game really well, and which is a huge uh, plus when you're surrounded by quality internationals. So he is understated. He get, doesn't quite get the... Uh, the praise he deserves at times, but he, he's a quite a functional guy who brings the best out of his surrounding team players. And I think behind him, Carty's had a rough time since World Cup, but I think he's got the quality and the talent to be uh, there or thereabouts. And, and, and it's been nice to see Billy Burns coming through mm. in Ulster too. It certainly has. Um, I'm a lot more positive about Six Nations after chatting to you this morning, Andy. Thanks a million for that. Cheers yeah. for popping in. Uh, Deal or No Deal is next. We've got John Duggan and Phil Egan standing by. Back after these. OTB. AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball. Salah takes a shot. Oh! Oh, oh Paul Salah with one of the goals of the season. 25 yards out. If you throw your lot in and play senior international football with somebody, that should be the end of it. That's brilliant. Oh, my goodness me. You will not see a better try. Who will be all Ireland champions? Who will see their dreams turn into reality? Whose names will be etched in history forever? OTB Live. Never miss the action right here every Saturday and Sunday on Off the Ball. The Sport Ireland Campus Blanchardstown is the home of Irish sport, not just for our athletes, but for you and the community. For families, check out our kids' camps, sport academies, and birthday parties. For adults, why not join our newly refurbished gym with a 50 meter swimming pool or book one of our world class indoor or outdoor facilities, including our athletics track, sports pitches, and courts? And for companies, check out our team building days, conference facilities, and events. All this and more at sportirelandcampus.ie. OTB AM. I signed for them after the Euros. And after my first day's training, I was driving home. I was actually thinking, regretting it. What have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? Deal or no deal, John Duggan, Phil Egan, you're very welcome. Hello, Owen. Starting this morning with sensational news from Portugal and have the best rumour of the window so far on the way. So Manchester United's bid for Bruno Fernandes is dead, apparently, because they refused to meet Sporting Lisbon's £68 million asking price for the 25-year-old Portugal midfielder. They wanted closer to £55 million. Jorge Mendes, his agent, says he doesn't know what's happening. Manchester United obviously don't know what they are doing. We're not talking about this anymore because we have a more fun story, which is this. Manchester United can make a surprise move to re-sign Boca Juniors 35-year-old Argentina forward Carlos Tevez, according to Tuto Sport in Italy. That story has got momentum and been picked up by the likes of the BBC. It's almost 13 years since he first signed for United. The report says that the sensational move is being considered as a low-cost temporary solution for their striker crisis. Should the forward, who will be 36 on February the 5th, return to Old Trafford? No, not for his own safety. <laughs> because he obviously left. Or Fred Woodward's safety. Your mic is muted. Went to or Fred Woodward's safety. Yes, that would be a, a disaster for Ed Woodward in general as a, as a human being. So you're not having this, you're not having, uh, Car even for Carlos Tevez from his own prison? No. I don't think he's in the Henrik Larsson category where Larsson did make a positive impact on United. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not going to happen. I mean, you're talking about lads that have played years ago for, for the club. Like, sure, why not just bring back Dennis Law then? <laughs> he played for both clubs. Cantona. <laughs> yeah, like this is... Well, like, uh, I mean, he's, he's... Things are bad at United, but they're not that bad. What's what's his uh, form been like? What's uh, how's he looked? I know it's been like a couple of years since we've kind of been like, mm, could he still do a job in Europe? I don't think anybody's ever still having those thoughts about Carlos Tevez. No, definitely. Not. Right, bonus question: Who else should Manchester United bring back? Bring back? Are you talking about when they were like you bring them back as good as they were, or no, <laughs> no? <laughs> the only of the former players, like Zlatan, was obviously not. Somebody that I thought um, they would go for, but he's at, he's at AC Milan. The rest of the former players, not really. I don't really see how it's going to work. Um, but they need something, and this is a problem with United. Every transfer window, it's a saga. So Bruno Fernandez is the saga. The one in August or the whole summer was Harry Maguire. We've had Paul Pogba. They just take an age to do it. They might have. They might end up signing Bruno Fernandez, but. Is he the answer to their problems? He's one of the answers, but there's a lot of answers. It says on my sheet here, could Bex do a job in an auxiliary quarterback-style role, spreading passes to James and Martial? No. He, if, if you could bring on special teams and Beckham was just used for corners, then <laughs> perfect. Because how many times you see corners not even beating the first man, whereas Beckham obviously has an unbelievable delivery. But that's all. So just basically teach one of your actual young players who's actually at a fit professional age to beat the first man and you've got a better version of David Beckham. Yeah, That's your like, advice. Set pieces are such a vital thing. Look at Liverpool last night. They got their first goal from a set piece. Same on, on Sunday. They're, they're, like, they have the, the best record from set pieces this season. So I'm always amazed that teams don't do more prep or if they do, they just don't execute it properly. Right, Liverpool are interested in signing Real Madrid midfielder Isco, although the Spanish club want about 70 million euro for the 27-year-old. Is this a runner, lads? As they mature as a European power, will the next phase involve these names coming to the club? Do they need to start signing Galacticos? No. No. Well, who would Isco replace in the team as well? Yeah, they, well, they, they could definitely do with players in midfield. There's probably, I'm thinking, watching them last night, obviously Mane went off, so, uh, and we talked about this earlier in the week about maybe sign an, uh, an out-and-out goal scorer. They could do it one or two options in midfield as well because it looks like Lallana is going to leave. Don't know exactly what's going to happen with uh, Gini Wijnaldum because his contract is up. I read that he could be on the, on the move. Yeah, not this summer, but the following summer his contract is up. So they might take... But then again, you watch him play and you think, how could they let him go, give him a new contract? But players like Isco, he, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't classify him as a, a Galactico. No, it's, it's true, I like, suppose. He, he could work because... Mbappe would be a Galactico. Yes. And you, you're but, uh, very anti-Killian Mbappe. Are you anti-Killian Mbappe? I, yeah. No, I, I love Killian Mbappe. No, if, he, if he had him for free, no, he didn't even have to pay him any money. just he thinking... Him. He's been flashing his eyelashes, Killian Mbappe, recently, about Liverpool. He, he, he certainly was, has. He was complimenting Trent's celebration where he... I just remember Isco at the World Cup, uh, the Spain-Russia game. The way I would describe Spain-Russia, as I think I did to you, Owen, is that they went on, a, on a, a journey in a car to a roundabout and drove around the roundabout for the whole day. Imagine being in a car driving around a roundabout for the whole day. That's what Spain did in that game with Isco. Yeah. A thousand passes. Yeah. He, he, would, he would work in that Liverpool team, but I, I don't know if they'd, if they'd sign him. And wasn't there an issue with the size of his head before? Yeah, massive issue with the size of his head. Yeah, David Moyes and Manchester United didn't sign him because it was an issue with his head. Yeah, like you, you, you might just not get a clean strike on that header, you know. It's, yeah. Normally uh, it's ego rather than actual <laughs> physical. Um, Tottenham Hotspur have agreed a 20 million euro deal with Inter Milan to sell midfielder Christian Eriksen, 27. But Barcelona may hijack that deal. Sky Sports say they are considering making an 11th hour bid to steal the Dane from the Italians. Do we have any faith in the Barca story? And will Spurs regret letting him go? No faith in the Barca story. Uh, you might see the prop that I've uh, luxuriously brought into the Off the Balls AM studio, the, the Tottenham Hotspur scarf. Sickening. Um, <laughs> we won't, won't regret letting him go, no. Ericsson's 27. At 30, will, be, will he be, where will he be in the game? Has he improved? I'm not so sure if he has improved. He's been a great player for Spurs and a really good asset, but uh, he doesn't want to be there. It's clear, it's obvious. Mourinho tried to persuade him, as he did. He did successfully persuade Oliver Earl to stay. 
uh, for Tonkin, I think, does want to stay. Whether they should give him a new deal, I don't know. But uh, get let it cash in. Get the tw- I think he will go to Inter. Um, they'll probably get 20 million. I think they were hoping to get maybe, you know, maybe five times that. But not are you are you still Jose in? I'm Jose. Yeah, I know everybody else is not. But I, I I'm in until I see what happens next season. Uh, until I see how much money he's given, what he does in the summer, and I'm still in. I'm I know the only person in the world who is in, but I'm just still. I'm I, sure I, Jose himself is in. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know the game has changed and everybody says that, but he still is a serial winner of trophies. And they might even win the FA Cup this season. Percentage chance of him qualifying for the Champions League. I went for 40% last week. Phil went for zero. I go for 15%. That's six points off fourth. Yeah, but the, this is the worst Premier League season. Like United, exactly. United have been the worst team in, in history to be fifth right now, uh, statistically. Um, like Spurs are they're, they're, they're very poor at the moment low, low sell suicide who's actually the only one I watched a bit of, I watched the last 20 minutes of them the other night against Norwich they brought the ball into the corner to try and kill the game there's such a gap between Leicester and the rest like they're, like, so it's really just Chelsea that you're hoping that Chelsea mess up because mm. there's such a gap between the top three we've got to move on to a couple of the last stories Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is open to a move to Barcelona that's from our good friends at Mundo Deportivo Arsenal are favourites to sign French midfielder Thomas Lamar from Atletico Madrid. Yesterday morning, Damien Delaney said Arsenal's real problem is their midfield, not their centre-backs. What do you think Arsenal's real problem is, Phil? I would like to ask that question to Damien Delaney if he played for 20 minutes alongside Scott Mustafi. Would he still feel that the midfield is an issue? Which, there is an issue there, but Mustafi is an issue. But maybe the issue is from the midfield and Mustafi, and then it's just contagious issue to the other centre-backs. Oh, look, Mustafi is just... He, is, he reminds me a little bit of Day and Lovren where they want that physicality, they want to throw themselves into tackles. Lovren obviously does it better. Um, I would rate Lovren well ahead of Mustafi, but just the other night summed up Mustafi at Arsenal, the, the back pass, which obviously ends up in Louise getting sent off for it. Yeah, one last one. John, this is for you. Newcastle United ready to make an offer for Tottenham's England defender, Danny Rose. Apparently they do want to sell him. Um, deal or no deal? Deal. Deal. By the way, Arsenal's problem, no lack of, or a lack of leaders. They've no leaders. They're soft, marshmallow soft. Oof, that's tough from the Spurs fan. That's either no deal for this morning. I signed for them after the Euros. And after my first day's training, I was driving home. I was actually thinking, regretting it. What have I done? I've like got walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? Coco Goff has beat Naomi Osaka in straight sets, 6-3. 6-4, she's into the Australian Open fourth round, and that's it really, you know. That's the case closed, that's the best young American prospect now. Forget it, age. you can take your Naomi Osaka, it's all about Coco Goff now. <laughs> uh, new feature, by the way, published on offtheball.com by Arthur D. worth reading. Um, it's in the week that Desi Farrell, of course, uh, replaced uh, Jim Gavin. Uh, what the, how many weeks are we out from that now, about 10? Uh, Arthur spoke to Mickey Nettles Sullivan. I don't give a damn what people said. It's about the idea of uh, replacing an idol uh, in his mind. Um, that is, uh, it is, of course, uh, Desi Farrell's first game for Dublin this weekend uh, in the Allianz National League. It is Kerry against Dublin tomorrow night in Croke Park. And that is your lot this morning on OTBAM. We are back on Monday morning from half past seven. Thanks a million to Phil. Thanks a million to John. We'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye. OTBAM. This is OTB.